Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Welcome to episode 67 of Unmuted. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a special uh, moment, a pillar in, in the Unmuted history because right now, as I'm saying this, it's streaming to three different platforms. It's uh, going on, on Twitch right now, it's going on YouTube, and it's going on Facebook. So um, I know uh, uh, I just got a comment from, uh, from Rashid over on YouTube saying I'm jo joining from YouTube because Facebook is not streaming on TV, uh, which, is, uh, which is the reason we, uh, we wanted to stream to so many different platforms because, you know, we want to make it as easy as possible for you guys to join the conversation live and, uh, and you know, uh, be, be, part of the, be part of the episode, man. I like it when you guys join the episode and stuff. So um, wherever you're tuning in from, uh, know that, uh, that I could see, the co hopefully, if it fucks up, don't don't come at me. But hopefully, I could see all the comments. I could I have like a thousand windows open right now, and um, and wherever you're tuning in from, we can we can uh, you can join the conversation. I want to give a quick shout out to Ala, uh, Rashid, Ahmed, Marissa, Aisa, uh, for everyone for uh, for tuning in. Thank you guys so much. And uh, and uh, you know. I, I said in episode 66 that uh, we're going to do a, a few more online guests uh, during this phase of the uh, the podcast. So I'm very excited about uh, today's guest because he's actually someone that I've I've been um, in circles with, in contact with for maybe like 15 years. It's crazy. Kind of makes me feel old, but it's uh, it's a very, very long time where, where I've known of him and known him and... Uh, gotten to be in the same circle and stuff like that so it's uh, very excited but before we get to my guest today uh i want to shout out uh third eye aesthetic third eye aesthetic is a uh, a personal trainer online coach uh, that you can uh, you can sign up with and um we have a very very special uh, unmuted discount code that you can you can use um splash uh, the, the guy's name is splash uh, the the trainer has been on the podcast before and has um had a 
crazy ass journey. He's, he's one of those inspirational people that I uh, love to talk to, but um, I'm going to play a little clip, uh, what he has to say and the discount code that you guys get uh, for, for listening to the show. Check it out. There's so much change that I notice every day. The divine connection that I'm meant to do this. And at the same time, I plan my day much better. I was not counting time. I hated exercising, hated it. And now I haven't missed a day. Another squat. Positivity. Cross knee drive. And a push kick. Get fit from the comfort of your home. Making me feel good about things when things get dropped. We go side to side. Walk out Corona, to move Corona. And on the way back, shuffle. Let's go. You get the best workout. Believe that every single time. You make me want to be better. I originally charged $50 for international clients, but when you use the code tap water unmuted, you get a 10% discount for the first month. Relax your body. Another inhale. So like he said in uh, in the promo, use the code TAPWATER and muted to get 10% discount on your first month signing up with Third Eye Aesthetic. And uh, we have a bunch of stuff lined up. Uh, I'm actually going to get my ass kicked from uh, from him. Uh, I need to... Um, you guys know I don't do a lot of fucking running around, but <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna kick my ass, and uh, I'm looking forward to it, and looking forward to documenting it as well for you guys. So check it out, join the class. I'll be there. Uh, get a ten percent discount. It'll be it'll be chill. We'll uh, we'll hang out together. Um, now, episode sixty seven. My guest is Rami Haikal from the Jordanian Doom Death Oriental Metal Band. They have such a like intense genre specification. <laughs> um, Bilocate. Uh, they're one of the very first bands that I actually got to uh, be a fan of. And and uh, one of the first quote unquote real bands that I found growing up in the Middle East, you know, I moved from Qatar to Jordan and I was like trying to get into the scene. And uh, every time I asked someone about, about metal music in, in uh, Jordan, in Amman, uh, they always brought up Bilocate. So I'm very, very excited to have him on. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's hit the intro and speak to Rami Haikal. Rami, welcome to the show. Hello. How's Hi, it going, man? Doing great. Thank you for uh, having me on this amazing show. I'm really excited about it. Uh, we've been planning for it since... Uh, three months now i know it's been a crazy amount of time it's been a crazy yeah. amount what happened is um th there's been unfortunately uh i pre-planned so far in advance uh, at the very beginning of the show that i that i stacked them up and then i didn't realize that if something did happen where i wasn't able to physically like do the podcast or something like that it would start rolling down so uh so I had to like juggle a lot of different episodes and try to figure out where everyone's at. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm glad you're you here, man. That, yeah, same here. I remember that you, you, you know, just notified me about it like three months in advance. I was like, what the hell? Adnan must be like a great planner. So <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was it was just a pure naive and optimism. That was that was basically it. <laughs> Yeah, um, but thank you for being here, man. Uh, just in case there are people tuning in that don't know who you are, if uh, if you could just introduce yourself in your own words to the tribe. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Rami Haikel, and most of you know me from uh, me being the guitarist of Bilocate. Uh, and uh, I just want to get the, to do to make a fast correction. We we're, we're dark oriental metal band. This is how we like we like to define our genre. And uh, we've been playing, um, I've been playing with Bilocate since 2004, and they started one year earlier. Uh, so we've been almost 16 years together now. Um, and uh, we played uh, different shows in, uh, in Amman and, and the surrounding countries. In Dubai, we played many shows, and that's how we know most of the people. Um, 
and some other people also know me about being a candy man <laughs> making toffees and caramels where, where with my ba- brand toffee melt um which is like a completely different uh thing from playing being a metal guitarist and and also doing candy at the same time um i've been doing that also since 2013 um and yeah this is like a quick brief uh, about me and we can talk into more details uh, later on in the show so i um I, I i said it briefly that uh, when i first moved to jordan one of the first bands that i actually got to know about was uh, were you guys and uh, the thing the the one thing that keeps uh, ringing a bell back every time I think of like how how long have I known Rami Haikal or when when did I first hear about Bilocate and stuff like that I just remember the specific uh, place called the Doors Cafe uh, oh, in, man. in Jordan that was like the only place that you could hang out and listen to it wasn't even metal it was just listen to rock music in general and man, it uh, was so funny that area that uh, like period of time the Doors Cafe and uh, we used to go a lot there and uh, it was just like uh, a shisha place not, not even uh, drinks no, no, nothing you can just get your tea or a can of diet coke and uh, have some shisha uh, but the cool thing that the owners used to play they used to like uh, metal and they used to play metal while you're um, at that uh, cafe and actually it's uh, they are the reason that at, at some point of time uh, I got addicted to shisha so you, we used to go there every day and have it there and uh, the guys were amazing and the, one of them uh, and they were like one of the few places that allowed bands to have like um, a small let's say uh, concert there uh, and yeah we met so many people uh, at that place like I remember it uh, re- really well we spent most of our times there yeah it was so the the very first uh, time I heard by okay, it was actually you guys at the Doors Cafe I think the whole band was there and it was just after you released the the first album and um, you guys you guys were you had them on both USBs and CDs I remember that specifically because I was like having really? USBs yeah maybe not like the branded USBs but you had it yeah. on a USB and I was like ah oh, so can I get it as an MP3 or a CD or like just buy it dude just support the fucking band just <laughs> <laughs> just buy the album and i and i still have it i still have that album Thank i you. think uh, that was 2005 I, I six i'm not sure if it if it was around that time definitely five i think yeah not six uh because you know after 2005 uh, you know what happened and they start banning all of these kind of things so i think in 2006 everybody was laying low and in jordan so uh, most probably this happened in 2005 so let's talk about that. Let's talk about being uh, a metal musician from Jordan in a Jordanian metal band uh, in a place that has not accepted metal for for the majority of the time that you were there. Yeah. Um, actually, it's a funny story that first, like I started the first time I played with a band uh, I joined uh, a band where actually he was um, an Armenian guy. Uh, he, he's, he was a drummer, Ara Salbishian. And uh, the guitarist was uh, a guy from the Philippines. Uh, his name is Philip. And the bassist was uh, Zaid Zakharia. I, I like remember Zaid Zakharia, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, man, that was a funny band. Like, we just uh, make, created a band and we started uh, playing. And at that time, I was a huge fan of, uh, I used to listen a lot to um, uh, hardcore, like uh, I'm a huge fan of Sepultura, of course, and I used to listen to lots of uh, Machine Head. So we were like trying to make something around that. Um, and But we didn't, uh, we never played a live show. Actually, we, we were supposed to play a live show, which ne- never happened. Uh, we, like we had even had the name, I, I forgot the band name, it was called Seb Lucine, it's, it's something in uh, Armenian. Mm-hmm. I think it's the Black Moon or, uh, yeah, yeah, Black Moon. So, uh, and we had the name on the poster, uh, but that show never happened uh, because of the, the reasons you just talked about. Um, and then, actually, while I was with Seb Lucine, uh, they knew Hani Abadi. Uh, somehow, I don't know how they... Who's the bassist uh, in Bilocate, for those that uh, might not know? Han, yeah, the bassist of Bilocate. Uh, so, 
what happened, like we were, we were playing and we were like, listen, we know a friend, uh, he's a bassist and we want to get him and to play together. We're like, yeah, let's meet him. And he came uh, and we just played together and we met. And then uh, like a week later, I received a call from him. He was like, hey, listen, I like the way you play. Uh, we have a band. We'd like to uh, meet and talk. Um, uh, let's talk music. I was like, yeah, but please, I would love to do that. And this is how Hani connected me actually to Bilocate. And this is uh, my journey started with, uh, how my journey started with Bilocate. Um, jumping to, to the topic you were talking about, our first show that we wanted to play with Bilocate happened in 2005. And it was in uh, Abdoon Circle. I forgot the name of the place. Um, man, I can't remember it. it, it um, I mean, it's been so, 15 years. It's, it's cool. Not to, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, just... just uh, for those that not, might not like know the the premise of what happens in Jordan, a show because there are no uh, venues that are dedicated venues for that kind of music. Um, it, it's usually in either uh, a venue that kind of is a coffee shop slash bar slash something else. Uh, it's always so it's, it's actually always, a nightclub. Uh, or a nightclub, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so there, they're there the are only people who used to uh, like uh, accept to rent you their place. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, which is still the same, uh, even even in the UAE right now. It's either a bar or a nightclub or something that you do it. So there there weren't any. Uh, uh, oh, book official is in the house. He says leaders. That's the name of the place. Oh, leaders. Uh, thank you, Muhammad. Yeah, <laughs> Muhammad has a great memory. So thank you for joining and reminding me of that. <laughs> Yeah, and um, so yeah, you were you were saying you, you guys were trying to play your first show in in two thousand five at Leaders. Yeah, so that show happened, uh, and we played, and then we played uh, two other shows, I think, in Jordan. Uh, one also in La Casa Rosa. I remember still the, the name. It's also a nightclub somewhere uh, in Amman. And the last, and also we wanted to play another show uh, later on. And I remember that we were playing the main headliners there. Uh, and as soon as everyone op uh, opened and uh, the main, uh, also the supporting bands played and when it was our time to play, I was like just going into the stage, uh, just, uh, just about to plug my guitar and to do, you know, the first chord to make sure that the sound is okay. And then suddenly the electricity went down <laughs> and you hear people saying, shorta, shorta, police, police. <laughs> so, and like, apparently they came and um, we had to run uh, away from that place. And that was the last time we tried to play a show in Jordan, actually, 2006. Um, and since then, um, I'm sure lots of people, uh, if anyone from Jordan is following, they know about this story uh, that um, um, it, metal concert, it's not allowed at all. And sometimes they question some people about things. And I was never questioned, luckily. Uh, but um, I know some stories that people uh, were questioned uh, about that. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, um, so yeah, that was like our last time that we tried to do something, as I said. Um, and from then, it made us think, which it was, it was somehow a good thing for us because it made us focus on doing something outside of Jordan. This was like an important turning point for us. We're like, you know what? Nothing is going to happen in Jordan and we will never be able to do anything here. So let's fo focus our attention to doing something outside of Jordan, you know? Yeah. Uh, and as I told you, it was a good thing for us because um, we were able to, uh, we started contacting um, uh, agents, uh, uh, you know, labels uh, with, uh, and sending them our uh, demos and uh, all the materials we had. Um, and we started started getting really great responses. Um, and of course, we played lots of shows in the countries surrounding Jordan. Um, uh, we played in Lebanon. Uh, we played in um, uh, Dubai, of course. We played in uh, Turkey. Um, so yeah, and then after that, we, we were like, okay, let's also focus, try to get to Europe, which was like a dream then. Um, yeah, and, and cool things happened. We can talk about them uh, later on uh, in the story. Uh, but about being a metalhead and playing in Jordan, of course, it was always... Um, you always felt... How can I say the name? Um, w well, I would say like, yeah, you know, as, as if like they don't really know what's happening and they have a, a, speci a, a specific perception of metal and metalheads. Uh, which is most of the 90% of the time is not true. 
Uh, I'm sure that there are some people who are like stupid and do some crazy things. That they, and then the government think that everyone is stupid like these people. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone, but um, <laughs> if you're if you're listening to this and you're one of the stupid people, you you should be offended. Yeah, I think. But, <laughs> yeah. Let me know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and especially you know what? Like I I, I believe I, I always believe that everyone to his own and everyone can do whatever they like and what they want. I, I'm not judging anyone. But when you live in a country that they have a specific rule for a specific thing, you have to live, you know, to be able to, to live your way around that rule and um, how, how this government and how this country, um, you know, uh, accept things. Uh, so if you do something opposing that, this is when, uh, for me, this is stupid, you know. Yeah. Um, but I feel, so... I feel like this, this dichotomy of being... Uh... N- not accepted in your own like you're you guys are very proud Jordanian band you, you say uh, you know the band's from Jordan it's not it's not ever a question where bilocates from and I feel like yep. this weird uh, sense of acceptance right like you you guys are super proud to have put Jordan on the map you played around the Middle East you pe- toured Europe you're you're the a big part of the Middle Eastern metal story and yet you can't play your own hometown because everywhere else in the world you 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 talk to bands from Europe you talk to bands from the states the primary arc of a band's lifetime is your hometown heroes first you're the local yep. legend you guys are the the hype of the town and then you start doing all that stuff where in the middle east a, a lot of people that uh, listen to the show from abroad uh, oh, I always get questions about it it's you you don't have that option Period. You don't have the the hometown hero kind of uh, uh, arc in general when it comes to a band story. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And you know, for us, it's been always a dream. Uh, we never dismissed the idea of playing a great show in Jordan. And, and honestly, we tried several times. Um, and once we in 2008, I think, or nine, uh, we wanted to to make a show legit in a legitimate legitimate way. And we actually contacted the, uh, the government and everyone who was responsible uh, to give you, you know, the uh, approvals and the licenses and all of that. Uh, but we, of course, we faced uh, a brick wall at the end uh, and they didn't let it happen. And actually, last year, uh, I was talking to one of the organizers in Jordan and he was like, listen, he was doing some uh, concerts. Um, and uh, I don't know why did they allow him to do some shows at that time. And he, he was like, listen, man, lots of fans are asking about Boilicate. Let's do something. And uh, you see, uh, come watch our show. And actually, I went, Ruba and I, Ruba is my wife, by the way. I went with Ruba um, to watch that show, to see how it's going, you know, and to check if it's, uh, if it's worth it to do something there, you know. And we went and uh, honestly, it was a very small show. But I, I saw lots of young people who are excited about metal and they reminded me uh, when I used to be a kid, you know, I was super excited to see uh, all the old bands that I used to look uh, at, you know, look after. And so when I saw that, I was like, you know, I looked at, at Ruba, I was like, you know what, even if it's a small show, I think it's worth it to do something in Jordan, regardless who comes, whatever happens, let's do it. Uh, we would feel good about it. And the same day, we were uh, we left the show and I, I, I told the guy, okay, listen, I will talk to the other band members because I was the only one in Jordan at that time. Let me talk to them and see what goes, what happens. On the same day, they, they raided the place and they took him to uh, to jail and he spent like two months there. I was like, okay, thank God we, we weren't at that, uh, you know, uh, concert. For, for so, organizing, like, for, for just organizing concerts. Uh, in Jordan, he, he got taken to jail. That's the craziest thing. Yeah, I, I don't know, of course, the specifics uh, about... Uh, I always try to keep myself uh, out of that. Um, so I don't know the specifics, but yeah, uh, basically for having a metal show, you know. Um, so this is this was always, uh, an, you know, a continuous struggle, uh, being a metalhead in Jordan and the, and the Middle East in general. Um, but you know, at at the end, you 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 find your way around it, uh, like we did. Uh, we started like looking outside of Jordan and outside of the Middle East, and it worked good for us. Let's talk about that because I see some uh, laminates behind you there, and the CD and a plaque and stuff. Let's talk about the the Bilocate journey since uh, since you've been oh, there. Yeah. First of all, when you joined the band, was it called Bilocate? Because I'm very curious about how the name came up. 
Yeah, it was called already called by Locate, uh, and uh, the story that uh, Wasim and Ramzi, uh, the brothers uh, who started the band with Hani Abadi, uh, actually they Ramzi and Hani, uh, they used to go to school together, uh, so they used uh, know each other since they used to be kids, and Wasim, who's the brother of Ramzi. Uh, they created the band, and the name was uh, driven. Uh, they, they used to love also Tori Amos, um, and one one of her songs she has that word by locate, uh, and that's where the word came from. Actually, the inspiration of the word. Uh, but for us, it meant more than that. Uh, the meaning of the word by locate it's to be in in two different places at the same time, and it actually it described our situation. Like, I was just about uh, to say, how perfect is uh, is a name for for the subject that we were just talking about? Like, you know, f- feeling all that love for hometown and not being able to be there, but be there somewhere else, but be there spiritually. <laughs> it's it's yeah, perfect. And, yeah, and actually, it, it also we relate to it in a different way as well. Like because we see ourselves, we're, we're metalheads, but at the same time, we never we have never been like a full time musicians. So, like, while having met, while being metalheads and making music and doing all of that, at, at the same time, we had our lives, we had our professions, our some of us already had his, his businesses. So it's as if living two lives, these two different lives, but they work really well together. Um, so yeah, it, uh, the name like it really describes this our, our like the way we think about music and our music. Uh... I'm just looking at the comments here. Um, Ahmed saying shout out to the whole band, uh, absolutely shout out to the whole band. And um, I've had I've had a chance to meet uh, each band member separately at one point. And uh, uh, like I was saying, one of the very first um, I wasn't saying actually I, I posted it in the um, the video description. Uh, one of the first Bengali, not one of the the first Bengali show ever. Uh, we uh, we actually opened for you guys, and it's I believe it's that uh, first laminate behind you. It was uh, it was such a good uh, a good show, the red yeah. one there. Yeah, the red one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it was that was that was the Svengali Svengali's very first show ever, and uh, we opened for Bilocate. I remember that very specifically because, like I said, Bilocate was one of the first bands that um, I remember from uh, from the Middle East and stuff like that. So it was a very cool like c- circle for me uh, personally because all the other bands I had in Jordan. I mean, we played basements and we played a farm once you know like jordan you don't play shows uh, like you were saying so uh so it was it was yeah please uh, no it was just it was just the first like legit feeling uh show that i've had in in my musical journey man you, you would be shocked where, where where we played shows in jordan <laughs> yeah farms like once we had like a show in a farm it was like the craziest funniest show ever uh, we played in basements. We played like <laughs> everywhere, everywhere, just to be able to hold something. And to and once uh, we played a show, it was the um, uh, uh, Chechen uh, uh, community house. Or uh, so. And, and one of guys was from Chechnya, and uh, he, he got his way to be able to take the keys and make the concert there. But like. Generally, people in jo- living in Jordan from Chechnya, most of them they are very religious. Mm-hmm. So when they saw that happening inside their like headquarter, they went crazy. And luckily, <laughs> nothing like we went out alive. But uh, it was like a very funny and stressful day. Yeah, it's. Uh, it, I remember um, uh, we were talking. Uh, Mohammed Barsh is in the comments. Um, Tarek Mirz is in the comments. There's a there's a few names that I can recognize. Uh, from from the old scene, and I remember the the farm uh, festival at one point. There, someone tried to put on like an outdoor metal festival in in someone's um, farm, very far away from the main city. And it, it, the the logistics that <laughs> that broke down when someone was trying to do that was very very uh, bad. But everyone had the drive. That's the main point. Yeah, Pe- exactly. people were exactly. willing to like take the risk just to play a half an hour set. Uh, to to four people, even it didn't matter. It was just let's play the show, let's let's get the music out there. It was very inspiring. Man, I, I did so many crazy things. Like if, if I think about them now, like I would never do it again for whatever reason. 
but like uh, when you when you're younger and like when you have like this passion that you want to do everything like we used to do lots of stupid things um like i'll tell you the story it's a funny story um the first show we ever got to play outside in europe actually was in lithuania uh it was in a festival called uh, devil stone uh and this was in, it was in 2009 and the problem was that we didn't have a lithuanian embassy in jordan um but we have a count we had a consulate in jordan so if you wanted and the show was let's say it was a month uh it's happening in a month um so we went to the consulate we were like uh, we want to apply for the schengen visa because you know from jordan you, you can't travel to europe unless you have a schengen visa so we said um okay we want to, to give you our passports to get the schengen visa we're like okay but it will take up to two months uh, oh, to get shit. back your passports with the schengen visa we're like no okay this won't happen so uh, our second option was to uh, and uh, the only country around jordan that had a lithuanian embassy was egypt so the only way to get to lithuania on time is to go to egypt and wow. get the schengen visa from there but being six members uh it was nearly impossible for all of us to go to egypt and do that because they need the passport and the uh, you have to go there so, so one of us wanted you know we wanted one of us to volunteer and take six passports and go travel to egypt and go to the embassy and of course i volunteered <laughs> so uh, I was like, okay, guys, I can do it. Give me the, your passports. And they, but the, like some people start telling me, man, are you crazy? Uh, if they catch you at the borders with six passports, <laughs> you, you'll definitely go to jail in Egypt, and you don't want that happening to you. Yeah. Um, and they, they'll think that you're doing some passport fraud, and you know all of that. Um, so I was like, okay, but I have to do it. I can't. I we will never miss this chance ever. So I, I actually traveled and I took six passports with me, passports, and I hid them everywhere in my bag, in my luggage. I don't know, man, how I passed the borders. Like I went to the embassy and also lots of stupid things happened there at the embassy. But at least uh, we were I was just about to ask, didn't the, didn't the embassy itself be like, hey, why do you have six passports by yourself? Uh, what happened is we contacted contacted them earlier. We were like, "This is the situation," and we had the official invitation from the festival saying that oh, we want to play. Yeah, yeah. And and I and honestly, when I went to the embassy, I had to beg. Like I stood on the door, like knocking on doors, and uh, and a funny thing happened. Also, Ramzi's passport was about to expire because you know they ask you to be to have six months validity. Yeah. Uh, in, in order to get the uh, Schengen and Ramzi. His passport was only had only four four months of validity, <laughs> so they were about to reject our application, and I literally stood in the door, banging on the door like uh, please and begging and calling people, but I was able to do it, and I went back to Jordan with the passports with the Schengen visas. See, this is this is the thing that I love about, um, and in the comments we're saying, uh, uh, if if it's a Middle Eastern band, you definitely have stories. So um, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, this is the thing. Imagine, imagine a metalhead in Lithuania uh, coming to the show to check out the band, and you tell him, you know what we had to do to get here. <laughs> so uh, we we had to fly to a different Middle Eastern country. Uh, one person had to take all the six passports, apply for the Schengen, like that. That's the kind of stuff that doesn't happen outside. And I think um, that's the beauty of of what makes the Middle Eastern metal scene uh, like that. That it gives it that edge, uh, in in my opinion, because maybe we don't tour, maybe we don't have, uh, we're not releasing albums every two years, but no one else has to had <laughs> must have done that, uh, like like Bilocate did. Yeah. Man, it's crazy. Like, uh, and and this was like a happy ending of, of of that story, but like also we had some sad stories. Um, like in two thousand two thousand ten, we had almost ten shows in Europe, and the major show was Metal Camp. Uh, we were going, we were we were supposed to play at metal camp and we even had our name on the t-shirt you know uh, <laughs> with all the bands and our first show uh, during that tour was in italy so you know if you're applying for a schengen you need to apply for the first entry which is italy yeah and they rejected our visas and we had to cancel all of the shows and like the metal camp people went crazy 
and after that uh, they would never like let us again <laughs> you know uh, play because for, for them we we canceled a show they would never understand why why we canceled for them we are a no show at the end but um, yeah it was only just it was just because we we couldn't get the shingen visa so yeah that was said but at least um, uh, then we we traveled again and things went to be good again let's um let's go through some some of the like highlights what you you're talking about you know touring europe playing turkey uh, all these things what's um what's a highlight for you given given everything that balak has been through uh, that you look back and you're like you know top 3 moments top top something moments top 3 moments i would say uh lithuania show was like all, for all of us members like it, it holds like special uh, memories especially and, uh, what you had to go through too <laughs> yeah and and you know do, do you believe that we had two shows uh, at that period we had the one uh, in lithuania and two days later we had one uh, in turkey in istanbul the yoni rock festival yeah um and do you believe that they, they only gave us um uh, schengen visas for only one day or two uh, I th- or two nights oh, so wow. we arrived so we arrived we played the show and we had to leave on the same day we played like we, we just we were just talking to people and all that and then the guys were like listen we have to go to the airport we have to leave <laughs> So, but still, it was like an amazing experience. Uh, it's one of the, our, our most beloved experiences. Uh, the second one, I would say, of course, the tour we did in 2013. Um, it was uh, like one of also one of the best experiences ever. Uh, and of course, we had to go through hell to do it, but uh, we did it uh, at the end. And also, if you if we talk. Are we talking shows or in general, like the? Bands, I think uh, I think in general, uh, like what, uh, looking oh, okay. back at, because because uh, I'll let you answer this because I, ha- I have a follow up question for it. Okay, so uh, the third thing, which is I, I would put it first, uh, of course, when we first uh, heard the uh, um, mixes from Jens Bogren, the first album that we did with him, this was. Man, I, I remember this moment till this day. Actually, I used to be a Java developer at that time. Uh, I used to work in a company in Jordan. So we, uh, like uh, Hani, Hani Abadi in the band, he's, he's the bassist, but he's also like uh, the guy, if you tell him, listen, we want to do this, he'll he'll break the internet. Like he would do whatever and he will reach to the person that he wants and he will talk to him and he will make it happen. So thank you, Hani, for doing that. <laughs> um, so we were like, listen, we want, we, uh, of course, we are a huge uh, Opeth fans. Um, the old Opeth, not the new Opeth. Um, <laughs> so, and, and when we saw that Jens Bogren was mixing and mastering their albums, we were like, you know what? We have to get Jens Bogren to do our album. So Hani was trying to contact him, trying to reach his uh, contacts, and they started talking to him and all of that. And we told him our case. And of course, like um, his mixing and mastering was extremely expensive. Uh, uh, the fees and all of that so we were like listen please listen hear our music first and let us know if you'll be interested to support us and like do something and mix the um, album for us and as soon as he heard the demos he went back to us he was like oh wow guys yes please i want to do this and he gave us like a crazy offer uh like uh, we would never ever dream to get that offer again again from him <laughs> but um we sent him the uh, the tracks and we, we recorded everything in Jordan, of course. Uh, it was all DIs and the drums was MIDI. So we sent him everything uh, and uh, he did all the reamping and all that. And the moment he sent us the first mixes, uh, as I told you, I was like on my desk doing some uh, coding. And uh, when I, I received the email, I called the guys immediately. I was guys, we got the email. So uh, we gathered. Uh, of course, I had to pretend that I uh, I'm ill at the company that I have to leave uh, I <laughs> no, to leave. take a day off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I was like, oh man, I, I have to leave. I so I took a day off and uh, met. We met at Baha's place in Fais. Baha is the guitarist of Bilocate. Uh, we met at his uh, room. I can't remember. Forget, of course, that day. And we listened to the track together. And man, it was like. I have goosebumps now from that uh, memory. Uh, it's one of our best experiences ever. Yeah, to I hear can your imagine. music uh, done professionally, uh, of course, and with Jens Bogren. It was like a, a crucial uh, moment in the, in the band's life. 
Yeah, that's that's gotta be a, a big one out there. When you guys released the first album, did you guys? When was the time where you're like, I want to take this band seriously? Like, when, when did you guys start off with? We want to release albums and play shows and make music videos. Because from what I remember, even um, I forget the name of the, the the track that you guys had a music video for back in two thousand five. I think uh, George Durzi, shout out to George Durzi, yeah, yeah, uh, filmed um, it. Days of Joy, Days, Days of, joy. of Joy. Like even back then, uh, fifteen years ago, Balakate had you know you guys were putting out music videos. You guys, uh, it felt like everyone was like punching a little uh, harder than the average metal band that was out there. Did you guys go out with the idea of like we want to take this seriously and and make it quote unquote like a proper uh, band or was it a hobby that you just happened to to work on? Oh. Of course, it started like for me. It's uh, maybe each each member of the band they think about the, these things differently, you know. Uh, but I'll tell you like my um, part of it. Um, for me, music, of course, metal was always my most preferable. And playing guitar, like my, the hobby that I always used to do. So um, and when I found Bilocate, I really loved the music and I love the guys. Uh, and for us, it was always fr- a really great friendship with uh, with everyone, you know. Um, so but w- then when we started releasing when uh, w- of course when you hear feedback and when you when you see that people they, they love their music and they love what you're doing um and especially the point when uh and actually this comes later but like yeah you said when you when we did the video clip yeah we wanted to go hard on it you know we wanted to do it properly we want to release music we want to uh, do videos uh, because we were testing uh, for us, it was like a new territories. We wanted to know what's going to happen with that, and we were passionate. You know, we, we were very passionate about it. Um, and then, when we, when um, Jens Bogren happened, and when we started getting all the amazing reviews um, from international magazines, because also Hani and Ramsey, uh, they used to handle all the PR and um, you know the communication with everyone and the, the marketing. Um, they used to handle that and they were, we were able to get amazing reviews and amazing feedback from like f- people who would, would we would never ever dream dreamt about having feedback from them at that point we was we said that man we can do something uh, out of, of this you know uh, so we pushed hard but as every musician know <laughs> music especially when it's metal um, you can't make a living out of it um there's no way in hell even like and metal is very underground uh, 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 for me i think it's uh, there's no way you can do it um so that's why for me until this day i, I believe that maybe at, i would love it at some point to, to to have it as a full day thing like um to do music all all the day but i still think it, it's hard to do and especially like I, I, you see now like with with corona most of the bands they're going out of it and they're like anathema and all these they were saying no we have to work and do something so i believe that it's really hard to make money out of it and what's nice about the way i look at uh, the band and i look at at music and metal in in general because i do it out of passion and i love it um, i'm always passionate about it you know Uh, but if you start doing it as a job and if it's and if it's a very stressful job, of course that it doesn't pay you well. Uh, I'm sure that I will start to hate it. So yeah. I love this uh, this thing about it that it's always on the side, but it's something very important for me. But it's not what's uh, making me live, you know. Um, yeah. And for me, this is the way I look at it. Yeah, that's very cool. I actually remember uh, the point in time uh, when I switched from like. Oh, yo, I want to be in a band full time. I want to be a full time touring musician to being like, I actually kind of enjoy doing music as a hobby, uh, a very, very well planned, thought out hobby um, that that we put a lot of effort and work into. But it's not what I aspire to do full time uh, for to sustain myself. I remember the time that switched and I remember thinking exactly what you were saying, like, I'm actually glad that it didn't turn into uh, into the the thing that makes me my living because then I wouldn't be enjoying it as much. It'll be, it'll, you'll have to tour. Like I've met, specific, especially when I moved to Dubai, uh, you meet a lot of the touring bands and stuff and you talk to them and they're like, we 
we have to tour or else, like we yeah. have to be out, especially after the, the whole like record sale industry changed and you just have to tour, you have to be out. And I, I started thinking to myself, like, what have I enjoyed? Like, all right, cool. We just released an album. We're going out on the road for nine months. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. it would have been a completely different uh, mindset, I think. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, we, 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 of course, we tried touring. And when we did, I would tell you that it's the best experience in my life. Yeah. But, but I'm, I, I see now I see why most, uh, when you see bands, big bands, when you see members saying, okay, I'm done with touring. I can't do this anymore. I have even big bands. And, and for you, you see, man, what, you're stupid. Why are you doing that? Uh, you're living an amazing life. But then when you understand that uh, it's hard to do that, it's not easy. Um, and like to be honest, we w- we would have never been able to do what we have done uh, if we didn't have a day job, uh, because everything costs money. Um, like even if you want to mix, to master, to uh, to send, even if you want to send uh, CDs for reviews, uh, you have to pay for all of that. You know. Yeah, even before uh, and, and any of that stuff. Uh, what, what, what the, I I forgot where I read this. I think it was an article on uh, Metal Injection or something, but. They're saying uh, that local bands, like if you just pay them whatever it is, like $100 uh, to open up a show for a local band and people are like, oh, but they don't, they don't uh, drag a lot of crowd. But the instruments, the, the music video, the, the printing the album, all that stuff cost them a ton of fucking money that if you just yeah. give them whatever, whatever it is, uh, $500, whatever. I'm, I'm just saying random numbers because de- it depends on where you are in the world, but something like that for for a local band uh is uh, goes a long way and it's never that's never the case we've never seen uh the the kind of injecting back into the scene yet yeah yeah exactly so for me um as i told you this is very important to have something uh, on the side to support that uh, and and this is why also we were able to do things honestly uh, uh because even if you have great music whatever like even if you have the best music ever but if you if you can't reach it if you if you can't get it to the people that they have to get it and uh, and now maybe it's easier but when we were talking in 2006 and 2007 <laughs> these things were different so um, yeah but now you can you can go to uh, you can upload your music um, anywhere and you can be heard easily but at that time it was super hard you you needed to have physical physically printed material CDs uh, and th- these things cost really mo- uh, mo- lots of money to do it. So w- what is your take on the on the digitization of, of the record industry? W- where do you stand? In, are you a pro Spotify or no Spotify? I'll tell you, I, I was, you know, um, struggling to accept the new digital age of uh, getting my music. Uh, and you know, like I lived in a generation uh, where having physical CDs or cassettes it was very important for us. Uh, and uh, from my generation, if you look at people, they, they cherish their collection of CDs and cassettes. For them, it's very important. Um, but uh, forget the the side, uh, the money making side for the bands. But I'm talking about, uh, you know, how do I feel about it? But then, you know, I started thinking about it in a different way because of course most of my library has been mp3s for forever you know and even if you have a cd you'll just trip it and put it uh, convert it to an mp3 and have it on your library um so and then i when i when i started uh, listening to music on bandcamp um i realized that you know uh, this is a way to uh, support bands uh, to buy the, the actual music from there because you're already buying, uh, if you want to buy a CD, I'm sure, uh, uh, label-wise, I'm sure it's the same. Like, they, they'll just give them the same cut uh, because labels take most of the money. Yeah. Um, but uh, I started seeing it, like, as a good thing to uh, buy things uh, using uh, websites like Bandcamp. And, I, I you know, I convinced myself... Um, to, uh, to to think about it like this is my collection so now i'm proud like if i go to my band camp i see the all the albums that i bought and now i consider that i shifted my b- mind from the physical collection to have it uh, digital uh still sometimes <laughs> you know i like to look at the physical things 
but uh, I was able to take that leap and go to the digital, um, you know, library of music. I'm always curious about that, especially when it comes to musicians from the Middle East, because it seems that there's always an extreme reaction. Uh, there's not a lot of people that are indifferent about uh, uh, the whole, you know, music moving to the. Even though it's been it's been a long ass time now, we're not, you know, it's not the MySpace era anymore. Like this is. The new reality that we're in, there's still a lot of people that um, that completely disagree with the way things are going, and people that are completely okay with it. There, it's very rare to find someone that was like, you know, I I learned to love it. Um, actually, uh, Tara in the comments <laughs> just went, uh, "Fuck Spotify." Uh, if you're Drake, then Spotify is great. If you're a Middle Eastern metal band, fuck Spotify. Bandcamp is awesome. At least the quality is way better. Uh, Bandcamp yeah. WAC files will always be better. But well, that's kind of what I'm talking about, about the, the extreme yeah, the reaction. Cool yeah, yeah. But the cool thing about Bandcamp, as I told you, um, I, I don't have a Spotify account. Uh, I, I enjoy my music on Bandcamp. And as I told you, like you, it feels different. Like if you subscribe to a service and you get all the music that uh, you can, it's different. I still like the feeling of buying something specific, you know, and this is why I like to go to Bandcamp because I, I like I listen to music. You know, you can listen to most of the bands on uh, Bandcamp for free and some of them, they let you listen to it uh, unlimited times. But, you know, it feels so nice when you like music and when you love it, uh, you just go and buy it. It feels so nice. It's as if you're buying a physical album. Yeah, hundred percent. I completely agree with that, and I think I'm I'm one of those people. If anyone puts out uh, an album on Bandcamp, uh, I always I always make sure to go purchase it. Even b the bands that don't promote the Bandcamp, if they already have it on Spotify, <clears throat> uh, even though I do have a Spotify account, I have an Enagami account, all that stuff, I still buy the album and then listen to it on Spotify. Not necessarily yeah. uh, need need to, but that was like my purchase instead of uh, just waiting for them to count up all the cents to actually make. <laughs> a sale of, you're already in a very distant far away pool it, just being in the middle east musician in general and then that pool gets smaller because you're a middle eastern metal musician and then that pool gets smaller because and so it, it trying to trying to break out of it is a is a very difficult thing yeah and uh, of course in jordan it was of, at the same time it was really hard to buy original uh, music um uh, most of the music that they even used to sell uh, at legit shops, most of the most of it was like uh, copied CDs. Uh, before uh, they didn't care about uh, IP laws and all of that. So and it was really hard to get like an original CD. And if you get one for you, this is like you put it uh, in a in a frame and you hang it on your wall because like it, it was something hard to get. Um, but now uh, I see that it's easy. Like you can just buy something online and that's it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But how important was the the online world for uh, for you guys in the early days? Because you can't play shows, you can't sell your CDs uh, in Jordan. Um, I would assume that that you guys went heavy on promoting the band uh, on, through the internet. Yeah, uh, and as I told you, uh, this was the job of uh, mainly Hani and Ramzi. Um, and they were able to contact lots and lots of uh, people, uh, magazines, uh, reviewers, um, and uh, and of course because we were able to play a show in Lithuania. So if you contact someone and say, yeah, okay, listen, we had uh, we played this show here, and this is uh, here is some clips from our show, and here is our music. Um, it made a difference, you know, uh, especially that when you say it's. Uh, uh, mixed by Jens Bogren. If you add uh, always people like names, unfortunately, uh, but this is the truth. This is the rea reality, you know. Uh, so if you say that this is mixed and mastered by Jens Bogren, uh, it's as if you 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 give it the seal of approval already. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so people were like, yeah, listen, oh, we'll listen to it. We'd love to to hear it, and uh, and this played well really uh, for us, um, um, and that's how we were able to get all of, all of the attention. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That I think I think and of course, um, and of course our music is uh, <laughs> is really good. But <laughs> no, just about to say, of course, this is, uh, this is like the uh, how they say it, uh, the icing on the top. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like you were saying earlier. You know, uh, you could be the best metal band in the world, but if you don't uh, have access to the people that might even like it, 
uh, you you don't have don't have uh, an audience whatsoever. It's half the battle is making the music. The other half is actually trying to get it to the people that might like it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, true. And uh, so, but you, you guys are all in uh, in completely different uh, countries and locations right now, right? Yeah, actually, this is also one of the things that uh, it got us really slow. Um, now, currently, I am in the Netherlands. Hani Abadi is in the States. Uh, Ramzi and Wasim, they are in Dubai. And Baha, he's in... Uh, and Ahmed also is in Dubai. And you have Baha in Saudi Arabia. So, actually, so many times we, we had to do some online composing sessions using Skype. Um, just to, uh, you know, get things moving. Um, but of course, like, I really miss, uh, like, our, our peak we were, we, when we used to gather together. We always used to gather at uh, Baha's uh, basement and also at Ramzi's uh, house in Fahis. Um That's when we used to create music like crazy, you know. Uh, because, you know, you have the vibe when everyone is there, you hear the music. Uh, it's really different than when everyone is in different parts of the world. But like we're still trying to uh, make it work somehow. Um, and hopefully, uh, and we, we have a surprise, as I promised everyone, we have a surprise today. Uh, we'll, uh, we have uh, one of our new songs from our uh, new upcoming album. Um, it's a demo. Uh, let's say it's a teaser. Uh, we'll play it later on when you feel it's uh, a good time to play it. I'll, I'll talk about it when it's the time. Let, let's, uh, let's, t- let's lead up to that. Let's talk about the... Um... Uh, the lead up from from the last album. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the last album, uh, Some Bygones, all the way up until deciding to write. Because how many years has it been since uh, since your last album right now? Oh man, it's been since 2012. Yeah, you you guys have, uh, have eight a ch- years. chunk of history uh, in in that eight years. Yeah. Uh, so let, let's talk about from releasing that album because. Um, because what I, I always try to uh, talk about this as well. Because Vingali uh, took five years to to release uh, our last album, Sayonara, which came out in March, and um, I had a conversation on on the show with Jam about just the amount of shit that gets thrown your way, just general life stuff uh, that can uh, completely derail something like recording an album, especially when, like you said, everyone's doing their own job, everyone's got their own families, everyone's doing their own thing yeah. um, in a in a in a part of the world that doesn't already kind of uh, support this whole uh, art in general. So um, w- what are kind of the, the, the things Bilocate went through in, in the last eight years leading up to you guys Skype sessioning? Let's, let's compose again. Um, so like I'll start from the summoning the Bygans album. Uh, that album, when we released it, uh, the, because, you know, when, when we had, uh, sudden death syndrome with Jens Bogren and when we saw the difference that he made uh, of course uh, engineering it mixing and mastering it uh, and the album before that we had really amazing songs and we really loved most of the, the songs which was released uh, by us just mixing mixing it uh, at a very uh, a small PC and uh, we were using Cubase and you know just trying to put things together um, so after uh, summoning the Bygans, uh, sorry, after the Sunday Syndrome, we felt like we really need to re-record so- most of the songs that we released in our first album, Dysphoria, uh, and give it that same treatment uh, the way we treated the Southern, uh, Southern Death Syndrome. And that's what we did, actually. We re- re-recorded most of them, and we added uh, uh, two uh, or three uh, new songs to the album Uh, they were composed uh, completely new Um, and then we also resent it to Jens Bogren and uh, he did an amazing job Um, and then actually as soon as we start uh, released um, Summoning the Bygans we already started working on some riffs and some we had some ideas and some songs so we started working immediately Um, uh, but you know as we were talking because of us being separated and everyone in a different country, it took uh, so long to be able to complete it. Um, and we used to uh, to have, of course, uh, like uh, meetings online and to talk what's next and what we have to do next and all of these things. Um, and then we started doing uh, online uh, composing sessions uh, to get things moving. Uh, 
But you guys, um, uh, you guys played shows in between all of that as well. Uh, I remember specifically the one with uh, yeah. Katonia in uh, in Dubai in 2017. Yes, true. We played some shows, um, but the, the thing is, we were we were composing at that time. But we also we took some chances of playing live because you know part of a huge part of making music is uh, playing live shows uh, because we love it uh, and we love to play live. So whatever chance we used to get, we used to take it. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and we kept working on the album, and lots of things happened. Uh, some people traveled. Uh, I traveled. Uh, so uh, you know, things uh, life kept throwing things at us to uh, to make us slower. But uh, at least we're still uh, working on it, and hopefully, uh, very soon we'll have something. And um, with that, uh, do you wanna do you wanna set up uh, the clip we're about to hear? Yeah, of course. So. Um, we, we decided, me and the band, uh, we decided to play something uh, on the Unmuted show. Uh, and this is like the first time we'll ever play this uh, song. Uh, this is, a, 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 we cut some parts from uh, a song that we're composing. It's called The Resurgence. Um, it will be a concept album. Um, I don't want to talk about the concept a lot because uh, uh, we're still working on the uh, rest of the lyrics and the songs, so I will deep leave that later when we have a more solid uh, uh, thing to release. But uh, this song is very like special for us because this is the first song that we started. It started with one riff. Uh, I was like actually sitting with Wasim and he was on the keyboard and I was playing a riff, a chord, and he was like, oh, listen, what's that? Repeat it. And I started building it and it started from there and it turned into an amazing song. So, um, and this song that we're going to play now, actually, I did the mixing and mastering. Uh, I'm not a, a, a very professional. I, I do it like also as a hobby. So, but it's, it's we, what, the way we actually do uh, our mixes and how we deal with them. I usually handle uh, the technical things for the band, like uh, the recording, the mixing, the uh, what we use, uh, even the equipment and all of that. So, and then... I create a reference mix mm -hmm. because, you know, as a band, you know uh, how you want your music to sound like. And, you, you know, when when because we have lots of instrumentation with the keys and the guitars and the bass and the vocals. So we know when we want this to be higher volume, this lower. So we create a reference mix and then we send this reference mix to whoever is going to mix our song. Uh, so this is. Uh, let's call it a reference mix. Uh, I tried my best to make it as good as possible. So I hope that you enjoy it. Awesome. And um, for, for everyone that's tuning in live uh, right now, I want to see some fire emojis in the comments if you guys dig it. Uh, every time we play a song on the show, if you like it, fire in the comments. And um, here we go. Let's listen, uh, let's listen to this teaser. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it off.
thing. You can't hear me? No? All right. Uh, is it better now? Uh, yeah, let's try that. I don't know what happened here. Okay, yeah, let's let's try that. <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry about that, guys. Uh, we're gonna try and figure out what the what went on with the uh, with the audio. Uh, just trying it out. Like I said, we're trying some new things here today. Um. Uh, congratulations. Uh, now we can. Uh, that was awesome from Ahmed. There's a whole lot of uh, fire emojis. Uh, Mohanad, fire emojis. Um, let me just make sure that. Yeah, one second. Let me just make sure. Uh, let's go to. Here, bear with me, guys. Is this better? All right. And there we go. All right. We're back in business. Uh, let us know if you guys can hear us, everyone in the comments. Uh, let us know if, if everything is good with the, with the audio now. Because um, uh, it messed up. I don't know. Um, but there's a whole lot of uh, fire in the, in, in the comments. Uh, Matsum is also in the house. Shout out to Matsum. Shout out to Metal East Records uh, over on Facebook, throwing some fire as well. Um, so tell me a little bit about the uh, the track that we just heard. Um, as I told you, this track started from a riff. Um, and uh, uh, usually, actually, usually the way we compose music, um, when we used to be to all of us together, the way we worked around music is first it started with Ramzi composing lyrics. Okay, uh, and then we always worked on building the mood using the lyrics that Ramzi created, you know. And this is why most of our music, uh, it's very fluid and it go, there's ups, there's downs, there's fast uh, beat, there's angry beat, there's sad beats, there's mo uh, melodies. Uh, and actually, it all, all of it depends on the mood that uh, is set by the lyrics and the lyrical content, content, yeah. content you know. Um, but given the current situation and uh, like everyone is in, in different places, um, uh, th th our composing ha has shifted a little bit. We still work in that uh, approach. Uh, we try as much because this, uh, we feel that this is like the heart of Bilocate and this is how we make, make music. Uh, but you know, sometimes you have to, uh, to cope with the situation and how things work and, uh, work now because everyone is, uh, uh, we're, we're we're not at the same place, um, so yeah. This this song is the first. Actually, we have uh, three songs ready. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, the other songs uh, we're finalizing. Uh, we have the structure, we have everything, but we didn't uh, record the, the the final guitars and the instruments yet. Um, this album will have, so far, it's supposed to have between four to six songs uh we're just like thinking about uh, the the tracks w that we have because usually our tracks we don't have tracks less than uh seven or eight minutes um and actually we, and we don't do that on purpose <laughs> the, the way that we compose it as i told you that uh, we like to give uh, the atmosphere you know um uh it's fair justice and you know to give it time and to, to de develop the mood and all of that um so yeah, as I said, this song is, will be called Resurgence uh, and it will be part of a concept album which we will announce very soon. So uh, you, you mentioned the length of, uh, of the tracks and that was one thing that always used to stand up to me uh, when, it was, uh, when I, when I uh, listened to Bilocate is you guys really do like, like a journey of, of music. It's not a track where it's verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, outro kind of uh, structure whatsoever. And... Uh, like you said, it, it came naturally to you. Uh, you don't plan on uh, on making the songs longer. But what is it about doing longer songs and uh, and writing more like concept albums, concept kind of grander scheme songs that um, that attracts you versus the the standard you know verse chorus verse chorus? Yeah, um, 
this is always like a debate and I, I have debated this thing with lots of my friends and uh, I did that with Tariq lots of time. I've, I don't know if he's still with us. Um, for me, I, I there's, not, not, there's no right or wrong, you know. Um, each style of composing and each style of music has its own uh, i listen to lots of styles i like the death uh, metal band and i like to have a song with only two riffs i don't mind at all you know but the way we do music with bilocate as i told you uh, it always re- it always revolves around uh, a specific concept um, and it starts from the concept of the album and the concept of the music that we're creating um and then it goes into a granular level uh, with every song and every part so and that's why um as i told you like when we ramzi sometimes ramzi writes amazing lyrics and and these lyrics he has diff- really varying moods and varying feelings in these lyrics so we really take our time to read it really well and then think about how can we if it's an angry part how can we give give it fair you know to uh, fair representation this part mm-hmm. uh, through th- through the music and that's when we start adding things up we then m- maybe st- we start with rf uh, we uh, then uh, wasim adds nice keyboards or maybe the opposite maybe wasim has like a very nice key uh, keys that he's playing sometimes hani comes with a, a really nice riff that he came up with and we we see that it fits to this mood and then we build on it so it's a very organic uh, i would say dynamic way of uh, composing um which give it which gives uh, our music uh, you know this feeling of not being just uh, you know a static song with uh, two riffs and uh, uh, and playing uh which we which we really love and this is like the uh, the essential um, you know part of uh, of bilocate So this is uh, this is one of the things that um, the very is very very different between uh, Bilocate and and my band Svengali is that we uh, have a very closed uh, session when it comes to uh, to writing. I um, JM and I sit down. Uh, we write all the music, all the lyrics. Uh, we demo it. All the stuff uh, goes into it, and then uh, we send it to the guys and. Um, they uh suggest you know changes and stuff like that but for the most part it's just jm and i and and we have uh kind of a closed uh door uh policy when it comes to that stuff how hard is it to have six dudes <laughs> with six opinions and six different tastes and styles and six different intru- instruments uh try to try to squeeze in all their parts in a 15 minute song <laughs> man it's it's really hard and uh And for that, uh, this is also a shout out to Wasim, uh, uh, Wasim the keyboardist of the band, because Wasim in the band, um, he serves as let's say the uh, creative director of the band, the, the mediator between the the, the rest yeah, of you. Exactly, and, and Wasim he does an amazing job, um, you know, put, putting everything together. And um, so many times, like we had conflicting, uh, you know, ideas and conflicting thoughts about specific parts specific things that we used to compose but then we we really trust Wasim with that uh, i believe that Wasim he's he's a genius when it comes to music um, and he has the ear and he ha- like he, he knows when some certain parts work here and they don't work here so uh, yes we we come up with uh, every, every as you said every member in the band has a different style uh, we we listen to totally completely different styles of course we have things in common but uh it's all over the place um so yeah um, and we come up with so many things and then we when we when we put everything together we um we think about it together and we seem give suggestions we give suggestions and this is how it works and this is why it takes lots of time actually yeah. uh, it's not like uh, you have this ref and let's put it and we want to have it uh, and you ask the drummer yeah you have to put something on it this is uh, this is not how we work you know um Uh, so many times we keep, uh, you know, back and forth, and uh, let's do this, let's try that, and even sometimes it happened, even after doing the final recording, uh, and this happened with us even uh, actually in sudden the syndrome before sending um, the tracks to Jens, I discovered that I didn't like my line of guitar. I was like, hey guys, listen, um, I can do something better. Like let's, and I did something and I sent it to the guy. After oh, yes, yes, everything yes. was done. Yeah. So the, uh, we, uh, we like to. Sometimes it's not uh, good to keep changing uh, because it drags things longer. But we like to do it this way because we, when we believe that there's something better that we can do here, we like to do it uh, the best we can, you know? 
Yeah. And absolutely. when you when you're doing an album for us, it's not like we 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 uh, release an album every month, you know, or every year. Um, making an, al- an album takes lots of effort and lots of time, and um, so if you want to release every six or seven years, it has to be perfect, you know. It has to be the one you want to release. That's exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but speaking of that, speaking of the the distance between uh, each album, speaking of the rarities of the shows, and uh, you know it, all, all the struggles having to go on tour, all that stuff. Um, what is uh, when it comes to the band specifically, what is uh, successful? What is success to you when it comes to Bilocate? What when when do you think look back and go that was a successful band? That was not a successful band. Uh, you mean uh, in our journey? Uh, in, in your journey? journey, yeah. Like what makes what makes what is uh, success to you when it comes to the Middle Eastern metal bands? Success for me, uh, for Bilocate. Uh, I'll tell you how. Um, like for us, being in so many reputable magazines, of course, like being reviewed by the top reviewers and getting amazing, amazing reviews from all of these people. Um, and also like the fact that our Sudden Death Syndrome album uh, on Metal Storm, it's still considered to be one of the top 100 uh, doom metal albums of all time until this day. This is like a, a huge uh, prize for us, you know. Um, and you know the fact that you know sometimes it's so, so funny and so silly but like sometimes even until this day before leaving jordan when i used to uh, doing some work for toffee melt and i want to print something for toffee melt and i go inside the print press and the guy looks at me hey man you're the guitarist from bilocate i listen to your music i'm really a huge fan this things means a lot uh, you know, it, it means the whole world uh even like we've been uh, out of the scene for so long and not releasing anything new but still, some people they dig your music and they um, they can't wait for a chance just to say uh, I, I'm a fan, I like your music. Uh, this is like um, a huge pride for us as well. Um, and yeah, so yeah, I, I would say it's, uh, success is to have recognition for what you do uh, and to have the right recognition um, uh, and see the, you know how it reflects on other people. Do you guys? And, uh, uh, no, sorry, keep going. No, I was going to say that uh, of course uh, as well. Uh, so many times we've heard that we've been, we've been an inspiration for lots of people as well, which is which is amazing for us to to hear that as well. That was actually where I was going. I was going to say, do you guys um, uh, either either know or get uh, any kind of messages from from the Jordanian uh, metal scene, from the Jordanian metalheads? Uh, because off the top of my head, I don't know many other Jordanian bands that have achieved uh, the, the stuff that Bilocate has um, uh, in, in terms of uh, the albums released, in terms of music videos, in terms of the touring, all that stuff. So for a full country of people and a full scene of metalheads, uh, the, uh, Bilocate, uh, from, from the best of my experience, uh, was, was the uh, pinnacle for, for a lot of the people, uh, especially the, the metalheads that are interested in being musicians. Um, is there anything there that you guys uh, used to get back from the scene? Uh, let's be honest, like the Jordanians, they're not the best people to uh, express emotions. <laughs> 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 let's, let's put it nicely this yeah, way. Yeah. But but also, yeah, of course, like when we, you, you meet people, you always hear things. But also, this is something maybe um, yeah, for, from our, my part, I really don't uh, mingle a lot, um, you know, uh, in the metal scene uh, just because you know I was really busy with my business and doing other things and you know how the situation is and when you when you're running your business um, in Jordan um, I can't risk having anything affecting that you know so I, I, I always try to uh, keep away I'm, I'm always present uh, online like we release our music and do all of that but other than that I kept away, uh, kept myself away from the scene just to, you know, work on my business and my, my life normally. So maybe something this, uh, I let's say, uh, I didn't do, I, we didn't connect really with the scene, but this is how I, I thought that this is the best way to handle uh, the situation. It was, uh, from my perspective, it was a very interesting uh, uh, arc because I remember you know the because i was very i was always very involved in the scene i i either had uh, some sort of um like a, i remember i had a, a 
a, a podcast before it was even called a podcast. I had Mohanad on uh, on the very first episode for when he was in Tyrant Throne. Uh, it was called yeah. Camelhead Podcast. Um, I I always did interviews. I always did reviews somewhere, uh, whether it was on Jorzine or 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 stuff like that. I, I was very very heavily into uh, being a part of the scene. I still am. I mean, this whole show is based on you know the Middle Eastern scene. I used to have Have You Seen That? All that stuff. Uh, uh, Mohanad in the comments saying camel something. Yeah, it was Camelhead uh, podcast. And um, uh, I, I remember distinctly the uh, the the kind of uh, it, w- it wasn't attention. It was there. There's this thing that happened with Bilocate specifically Bilocate in the Jordanian scene and to a broader spectrum the Middle Eastern scene where. Once you guys started releasing uh, the albums and started playing bigger shows, uh, you were you were all of a sudden not you were the enemy in Jordan. You were like, oh, that that band, uh, Bilocate is is too big now. But there was no one else in, in the Jordanian scene. It was such a crazy, weird trip. And I remember, I think I had a conversation with uh, the vocalist Ramzi about it, and uh, and it was just one of those things that um, taught me more about the the herd mentality of uh, of the group of metalheads that make up uh, a small scene uh, where like i never understood for example when you watch documentaries and stuff where people were like oh as soon as metallica got signed they they sold out and you're like no they just grew uh, but oh, people man, don't no. want bands to grow <laughs> they want them to be theirs and theirs only and i feel like bilake went uh, went through that for a while yeah and um, like I don't like to go into this, of course, but like the metal scene in Jordan, I would say it wasn't very uh, uh, supportive, let's say. Um, um, the, I don't like to talk about these things, as I told you, but uh, of course, you always have some some people that they affect and they, as you said, the head mentality as well, like they affected the opinion of so many people. But for us, you know, when we saw that, okay, we, we, we did uh, what we did and we, were, and we had recognition uh, from somewhere else, we had to follow that recognition and ke- keep building on it, you know. Um, but still, uh, again, uh, like our dream is to to go to go back to Jordan and have an amazing show and have a big. Uh, we always dreamt about having a really big show with lights and and to do it properly. But I don't think that this will ever happen. I actually have the same dream. I genuinely have the same dream. I um, I remember it started building when uh, uh, we were preparing to play uh, open for Sepultura here in Dubai, and uh, oh. and I had a conversation with uh, with one of my friends saying, imagine that. Let's let's just imagine that uh, Sepultura did because at that time they were supposed to also play Lebanon. Now it got canceled, uh, the Lebanon uh, show for for Sepultura. But I was saying, imagine uh, we can we can organize it in a way where a band as big as Sepultura get to play a Middle Eastern tour and the first uh, three, four opening bands, like a, almost like a festival lineup uh, touring the Middle East would be local bands from that country each time and uh, and go to Jordan and there'd be three, four uh, metal bands from Jordan playing and get the same experience that you would opening for Sepultura, the lights and the shows and the smoke machine and everything. And I thought, um, I, I thought that would be really fucking cool and then and then i realized it was and then they canceled oh, the yeah. show in lebanon and i was like oh okay so <laughs> it's probably harder to do it in jordan now oh uh, yeah, yeah never uh, i don't think that it will ever happen in our lifetime <laughs> i don't see it happening it's a very grim uh thing to say but um, i don't see it happening anytime soon you were saying you were saying um talking about like uh you know being an entrepreneur being a business owner in jordan and uh, the whole stigma that comes with being in a metal band, the kind of perception that the Jordanian um, community, not community, maybe Jordanian government or like the authorities in general have on uh, on being a metalhead and stuff. What, did you face anything um, uh, in, in between the two worlds, being a business owner and being in a, in a band that stand out to you where you're like, I had to explain myself to someone uh, like uh, you know, I've I've had experiences where I was like, no, no, we don't kill cats, uh, no, we're yeah. not we're not Satanists. You know what I mean? Like I've I've found myself in those situations. Was there ever a time where you had to explain yourself to anyone for for being in a metal band? Uh, while doing business, uh, in the business sense, never. I don't think it uh, anything, it happened to me ever. Um, and I, I, the way I treated my business, I treated it in a, like in a way that completely separated than. Uh, 
uh, separated from the uh, the fact that I'm also a metalhead and uh, I'm a musician was something I hate honestly like if it was me my dream was to to make a brand that's related to me being a metalhead and a, a musician and even I even bought long time ago I have a, a, a very cool domain name I'm hoping that one day I'll be able to use it and create a band out of it uh, to create sorry a, a, a candy brand out of it um but uh, in jordan i never had the chance to do that uh, because i knew that if because my my plan to start a business was to make a business that i can uh, make it um, ac- accessible to everyone it's not just a niche product for metalheads and and they are like you can count them on your fingers in jordan um so the plan was to create something that anyone can get and uh, and buy uh, and that's why we created a brand that's uh, that revolves around the product itself uh, more than it revolved around me um, and, uh, and we created it uh, ruba helped me a lot uh, at the beginning of the start phase uh, because um, she used to be a designer and she helped me designing the logo and uh, the branding and all of that uh, and it picked up and it went well uh, and then at, and then at some point uh, i wanted to do a rebranding uh, a branding uplift for the brand So and that's when I was like, hmm, I have to include myself more in the brand. Like I am the brand, uh, and my customers, most of them, they know they know Toffee Melt and they know that I am behind it. You know, so that's why when we shifted now, the logo is black and it uh, says Toffee by Rami Haikel. Still, it doesn't have my, my complete character in there, <laughs> I would say, but it's now it's more closer to who I am. Um, but as I told you, like at some day, at some point. Uh, I'm like I even have uh, an artboard for uh, a very cool branding for the the thing that I want to create you know boxes with you know uh, with cool names flavor names the satan's uh, chocolatey breath and you know all of these uh, like in a cool way you know yeah uh, and actually coming to the Netherlands um, I moved to the Netherlands with Ruba early this year um and one of the plans is to do something like this because you know here you can do uh, these things and people will accept it uh, and you you'll, you'll find the market for it which is important for any business uh, you don't do business for fun yeah? you have to make money out of it so let's um, uh, let, wait wait before we continue let's go back uh and and explain to everyone that um that is uh, watching or listening that doesn't know uh, about toffee melt um it kind of Give us a brief on 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 what the company does, and then I, I'd like to go back and kind of figure out the history of of how you got into this. Okay, so um, Toffee Melt, um, the brand I created and the business, it's uh, a, a gourmet uh, toffees and caramels brand, and I started this business. I started in 2010 actually, uh, and I come from a family. Actually, I'm the fourth generation of candy makers in the family. Even my great grandfather used to be a candy maker, uh, and it's written on his passport that uh, his profession is um, is a candy maker. Um, and my grandfather had uh, also he started from scratch and he built his own business in uh, downtown Amman. Actually, he used to make uh, candies with my grandmother at home, and they used to wrap it uh, by their hand and they go uh, just sell it on the streets of downtown Amman. Um, and my my grandfather was like a, a great entrepreneur. Actually, he went, he tried to do everything, every kind of businesses. He, he used to sell uh, chickpeas, uh, candy, rice, whatever you think of. He used to get and sell. Um, but then he found that he likes uh, also to. Uh, he focused on making candy, so he started um, his fa- his small factory, and then at at some point it turned into like a big business, um, and. This is where I came in. I, like, I was born in '83. I'm old, um, so <laughs> and in '83, like when I was born, it was like the peak of the business. Uh, it was going really good, but at, at early '90s, uh, business started, uh, you know, not doing good uh, because of the competition of the Turkish competition and all the products that used to come. And Jordan is not a very uh, manufacturing-friendly uh, uh, country. Let's say. Yeah. Um, So they started facing lots of problems, and then at some point they had to close the business. Um, and I personally, I studied computer science actually uh, at Princess Sumaya University, uh, and I, I started doing uh, Java development. But then at some point, 
in my life like when when the business was about just about to close i felt something you know i was like no i can't let this go away you know um of course they already dealt with the family business thing they sold everything but still i had this urge inside of me that i can't let this go you know it's it's a the family heritage uh, it's very important for the family and that's when i started making experimenting with some recipes uh, at home um creating because my my grandfather's factory used to be um, a, a more mass production commercial factory um so i tried to approach it approach that uh, in a different way uh, to make uh, gourmet and artisan uh, handcrafted candy uh, and it started from there actually i started from home giving some friends samples i used to go to parties with some candy in my pockets and give people and get their feedback um and so you know i started participating in some events like the christmas markets ramadan markets uh, mother's day like I, i used to be this guy in the middle of all ladies selling you know the, you know these markets most of them the most of them the ladies selling the handcrafts and yeah yeah uh, things and i'm the only guy with a beard and just standing in the <laughs> middle of them and sell, selling toffees and caramels <laughs> it used to be fun and actually a funny story the f- the first uh event ever i participated in it was a mothers day event and when i went there i i felt so shy because i was the only guy and i felt so awkward that i had to call my mom mom listen please come and help me please can you uh, stand on my booth and sell instead of me and she came and she helped me but then i was like yeah okay i'll have uh, to do it it's my business um so it started from there um and i, I of course i kept doing it while i was being a java developer so i i used to do it on the side uh, but did you did, before that uh that moment clicked where you're like you know what i'm not going to let this go um were you were you uh into uh culinary arts in general like were you uh, uh, into cooking were you was it something that uh, that you, have you made candy before for for yourself like how, or no. was it all from scratch i'm just going to do this head first actually it was all from scratch and um we think that you know my family when were they raising me as a kid uh because most of my family and the cousins they used to work in this uh, family business and my mom had this idea that i would never want you ever to go near that factory i want you to go to university and uh, you know have uh, a proper education and uh, have uh, uh, for her it, she wanted me to get a real profession you know mm-hmm. so so my parents were always trying to push me away from that and it worked naturally like i i, I of course i studied computer science because i'm uh, i really love technology and computers and all that i was a huge fan of that at that time um but um so yeah and when that happened as i told you i never tried cooking anything before i only knew that i went i used to go to my grandfather's factory and he had these big cookers so it's not even people used to cook it so it's just big uh, industrial cookers um but then i i find you know i had i i found something inside of me hidden that told me listen you have to do it try doing it at home and this is i thought i i, I taught myself to do it um of course i asked my father lots of things because he had some experience uh, with my grandfather um and but but i started researching the recipes uh, trying them at home uh, giving samples to everyone and spending all my salary on buying butter and uh, almonds and pistachio and throwing it in the garbage <laughs> with burning everything so yeah this is how it started and then uh, on uh, 2013 Uh, I decided that I want to take this uh, and make it a full-time job. Uh and of course I took this decision uh while I was already selling the product and at that point I knew that it could be a working business uh because I already have some customers and uh, I had some traction. So and literally when I quit my job I only had a uh, salary that will last me only for 2 months. That's it. Mhm. Uh, I didn't start the business. I started. I started literally from scratch. I didn't have no capital, no investment, uh, no backup from anyone. You know, uh, so I was like, you know what? It's a risk, and I have to take it. And uh, I did it. And I'm glad that I did that. Uh, and I've been doing it full time since 2013. Now, was there a sense of? Um, was it like? Uh, bel- uh, uh, self belief was it was it something like believing in the product believing in yourself or was it like 
like a leap of faith. Like I'm, I'm just jumping. I have no idea what's happening. Of course, the, the first important thing that I already had, uh, uh, I, I was already, I had already some traction uh, selling products to people, and they used to love it, and I used to get amazing feedback. Uh, and this is very important because. Okay, yes, of course, I had like a hunch that is telling me that you have to do it, you have to jump. But I'm not a fan of also uncalculated uh, risks and moves. Um, um, I don't support that at all. And that's why like I, I, lots of people used to ask me, uh, I have an idea. Shall I quit my job now and start doing it? I was like, no, man, wait, wait. Yeah. Uh, build your concept, build your idea use your salary use your uh, income that you're getting to build on that idea and then if you think it's viable and it's uh, it will generate income for you yes take that leap of faith but uh, don't do it blindly by not even have by not even having any traction unless of course you have a big investment and you have some backing of course you can do that but other than that you have to try it to make it work first see this is uh, i think this is that we found where you and i are very very different i'm i'm the face first into the concrete no parachute. <laughs> I just the 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 biggest decisions of my life have been, just been like jumping out of a plane, uh, hoping for the best. And luckily, up until now, I, I haven't smacked my face too hard on the concrete. But um, but for the most part, I I, I my uh, my like ethos, my my outlook is always to just if you plan too much, it'll it'll uh, it, for in my in my case anyway, it'll just uh, dilute the the situation. Whereas jumping out and 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 just trying it all of a sudden i don't condone don't quit your jobs i'm not saying that that's not what i'm saying guys if you're listening to this or watching this live don't jump out of planes uh without a parachute but um that's that's kind of been my uh, my thing even when it comes to music when it came to to doing anything uh on online to all the stuff that i'm making this podcast even uh i Actually, just i used to be like you exactly Okay, uh, I was I was never the kind uh, until I'm facing this problem. I, I try to be a planner, uh, but you know, uh, Ruba, she t- she taught me a lot uh, about that. Like she's the ultimate planner ever. Um, so even like it's so funny that when I used to travel with my friends and with the band members, we I never planned a trip. I don't know. I, honestly, I, I never used to know what planning means. Mm-hmm. So for us, it was like, you know, just buy the tickets and uh, just arrive to the destination and then do whatever. But then when I met Ruba, when we started traveling, uh, man, she, she used to have, uh, until this day when we travel, she has an Excel sheet oh, with, yeah. with, with timing and where we're going next and what we're doing. And, res- and she re- researched the hell out of the internet and Google and check where we have to go and all the local things. And at, at, in the beginning, for me, this was super weird, you know, what the hell, why are we doing this planning? But then uh, I discovered that this is the right way to do things, honestly, uh, because from my experience, I, I tried both experiences, especially with travel, uh, when you travel without a plan. And I tried this, uh, and Hani uh, knows about that if he's following. Like we used to some days just to spend time on the bed, just trying to find something to do because you're, you're, you're not planning, you didn't plan it ahead. Yeah. Uh, so you spend lots of time and effort just trying to plan while on the trip. But uh, then I, l- I learned the hard way and uh, Ruba's way that <laughs> this is not how life works and you need to plan things to make it to, to, to make the best out of things. Yeah, yeah. maybe, maybe the reason because uh, 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 my wife Tara is, is very much uh, the planner and uh, maybe maybe the reason my jumping out of planes worked is because she's I've, she's planned around my madness uh, to some degree. Uh, yeah, that's all I'm going to tell you. Behind your back, she, <laughs> she planned everything that you did. Don't, <laughs> yeah. don't, don't be too cocky, okay? <laughs> Uh, Ahmed in the comments says, uh, shout out to uh, Saad, Saeed, Saeed. Uh, Adnan mentioned this to Rami, please. Um, am I saying that yeah, name right? Yeah, yeah, Saeed, Saeed. Saeed, Saeed. Uh, he's one of the uh, employees at Toffee Melt in Jordan now. So yes, yeah, shout out to Saeed. Shout out to Saeed. And uh, <laughs> speaking of, uh, of that, uh, one of the employees of Toffee Melt in Jordan uh, you took and Ahmed actually he's also uh, the sales guy uh, for Toffee Melt in Jordan. A shout out to Ahmed and shout out to, to yeah, the entire to uh, Toffee Melt crew because because um, for those that don't know uh, or th- those that didn't um, tune in very early on, you said uh, you moved to the Netherlands, so yeah. um, uh, Toffee Melt still exists and is still operational in Jordan. 
uh, and uh, and you and uh, your wife have moved to, to the Netherlands. Tell me a little bit about about the move, having a, a company built uh, literally by your hands, the, the stuff that you used to make as artisanal handmade uh, candies and stuff like that, and, and the whole move to, to the Netherlands and how that worked for you. Um, actually, the way all, yeah, all my life, I wanted to move out of Jordan, uh, especially when I started the business, because I believe that... Uh, um, you know, I, I wanted to get to a bigger market and to uh, to a market where I can export my products uh, to, uh, to different places. You know, um, so um, what happened is uh, we were actively trying to uh, get to uh, to Europe or to the States or Canada. Um, and what happened is, is Ruba got a job uh, offer in the Netherlands. Uh, and it was like a, an amazing opportunity for us, uh, which we w- couldn't uh, re- refuse. Um, um, and it was actually a very challenging move because, as you said, the business I, I built it from scratch and I started all the, all of that, and it was really difficult to think about leaving it and uh, just you know get out and leave it and start something else somewhere else. But uh, of course, uh, with the help, uh, the great help I got from my father, because he's now um, managing it there in Jordan. Uh, he's helping me with that. And uh, also the guys in, uh, in Jordan, uh, Saad and Ahmed, uh, they're helping me uh, with the operations and the sales. And of course, I'm managing it from here remotely. Like every day uh, I have a call with my father. I have a call with Ahmed. I have a call with uh, everyone. And I, I still... I didn't disconnect myself at all. Like I still get orders on my mobile, uh, you know, uh, here even in the Netherlands, and I then I uh, uh, send it to the guys in Jordan. So, and it's still it's hard because also at the same time I'm trying to focus and build something here. So um, it's really hard. It's like I'm juggling between uh, different things. Um, but you have to do what you have to do, you know, uh, the business, you can't just leave it and let it, it, it won't run by itself. Uh, yeah. You have to keep on top of it. But um, so, is it is it yeah. difficult? Was it was it a, a decision that weighed on you? Like leaving leaving Jordan, leaving your hometown? You've I, I from what I remember, you've uh, you've lived there for most of your life. Yeah, yeah. I, I never actually uh, lived uh, outside of Jordan. Um, it was my, the first time in my life ever to live somewhere else than Jordan. Um, I, of course, I traveled so many times to Europe and my dream was I wanted really to live in Europe because, uh, you know, uh, I really want to, wanted to move. But of course, it was really hard for uh, so many things. Of course, uh, the family um, and uh, the friends and all the memories that you have there and the business. Um, it's it's really hard. It's not it's, it's not an easy decision at all. But uh, you know, Ruba and I, and as I told you, Ruba being a, a very uh, organized uh, planner, uh, like we used to sit together and plan everything and think about everything and weigh the um, advantages and disadvantages and all of that. And then we found out that mathematically speaking and logically speaking, it makes more sense to um, to move to the Netherlands. Um, and the, the fact that I believe that uh, if I started the same business here in the Netherlands, uh, I'm sure that I, 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 I believe that it will be even better than Jordan because the market here is because of the economy. You know, uh, of course, j- people in Jordan, they're amazing. And uh, I had so many people support me in an amazing way, of course. But the problem in Jordan, our region is the economy. Yeah, uh, and especially when you when you make something which is very niche, uh, it's not like a, a you know a, a, a cheap commodity that uh, you just find it uh, everywhere. So when you when you create a niche product, it's really hard to sell it and to gain lots of money from it in a very small market. And that's why I believe that it would do much better in uh, in an economy such as the EU. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, it, the the. Do you feel like the building process uh, started again? Like, does it is it reminiscent of the time where you were first starting uh, Toffee Melt and uh, trying things out and trying to get the equipment oh, together? Yeah. Or it's it's still Definitely. that same way, right? Definitely, because you know when you st- also like when I came here. Also, if you want to start, if you want to open a shop immediately and we want to go all out, you need uh, millions, a <laughs> uh, hundred of thousands. 
uh, at least. So um, if you want to start something, you have to start it from scratch, uh, building it uh, in small steps. Uh, so yeah, you have to go through all that process of uh, knowing, of course, the first thing you need to know is knowing the regulations, um, uh, knowing uh, how much will it cost you to start a company, start a business, then um, to, to, you have to understand the market and where you can sell your products, where you can't. Um, and luckily, the Netherlands is one of the easiest countries to start a business at. Uh, man, they make it so easy to start a business. They're so genius. Uh, like I, I've been living here for a year almost now. And I believe the Netherlands got to where it is now because they're so genius with money. And the, the concept they're running at we make it easy for businesses to start a business because we'll collect taxes from that business. Mm -hmm. So, so as much as you as business that can open, if you start, and of course there are regulations, but they made it so easy. You know, man, I, I registered a company in one day. I want you just pay 50 euros and you have your company registration with you and you're ready to do business. Yeah. So, but they're smart. They, they, they understand that in order to generate taxes and to generate income for the country you have to allow businesses to start and to be on track very fast and easily uh which is a very cool thing because i also i heard like some other countries in the eu they're not like that they are very uh, like in france i have some friends in france they say that it's very hard to start a business there yeah um so yeah and of course you need to build the connections meet people um understand how everything works know where you get the, your ingredients um yeah it's uh, it's it's a lot of work but it's nice like uh, i have experience doing that and uh, of course when we arrived here it was uh 29th of december and corona wasn't still a thing yeah so, ahmed in the, in the comments just said and then covid happened yeah yeah so like when when, you, when i arrived here i started you know, full on meeting people, going to seminars, going to talk shows, uh, all of these things, meeting people, building my network. And I did a really great uh, job doing that uh, in a short period of time. And people used to be shocked uh, when they know how much people I know. They were, uh, it was only two months I've been here. But then Corona happened and it, everything like went back to uh, starting point to zero um and now we're still struggling with the corona situation of course like everywhere in the world yeah um so hopefully things will uh, uh you know will go uh, good again i don't know when but we, we're waiting for that but we, we also you know i'm trying my best to keep it go keep it going yeah yeah absolutely i think um i i think this whole situation uh it leveled everyone like it completely uh, the, just it, it still boggles my mind i know it's been like eight months or seven months of this but it still completely amazes me the idea that this thing completely flattened out everyone yeah. <laughs> you, regardless of what you do regardless of where you are uh, think vocabulary like quarantine and social distancing and isolation things we would we wouldn't use on a day-to-day -day basis are now just uh, even autocorrect gets it it suggests it as a as a term when you're texting it's it's one of those um yeah. uh, crazy crazy things uh and you know um I, i'm i'm always like of course i follow always the news in jordan and so far two of my favorite restaurants in jordan they they had to shut down they closed the business uh and you know it's hard wrenching to see this is happening to businesses uh, and it's happening of course all around the world but you know some of the restaurants like we uh and if that is still listening like we had so many <laughs> nights after going out you know going to these to one of the restaurants and having a very late dinner we had really great memories there and now i just received news today that they closed so it's really sad uh, to see this is happening in the world uh, Tare, in but, the comments uh, are saying hatute is that it hatute exactly hatute uh, ahmed saying uh we'll make it uh, bro, don't worry with uh, with the muscle emoji. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, Rami is yeah, a big fan uh, of sabr uh, from Ahmed. Ah, ah sabar, sabar, sabar yes, that's one. Uh, Tara is also it? saying uh, your neighbors with uh, with a little upset emoji there. Oh yeah, oh, we didn't. Uh, I didn't tell you this story. I have to take about the neighbor story. So okay, okay when we. Uh, 
uh, when we were seeing each other, well, uh, Ruba and I, of course, uh, I introduced her to Tariq and his wife Zoya. And uh, we used to hang out a lot together. And we used, of course, to go to their house uh, so many times. Uh, and uh, and we, we know their building, you know, we, we used to go there every day, like on weekends. So then when we decided to get married, Ruba and I, uh, they were like, guys, please uh, find a place in our neighborhood. It would be super cool if you lived in the same neighborhood. So uh, so what happened is uh, our plan was to uh, to find something to rent in that area. And then Tariq was like, listen, uh, the owner of this building, uh, the engineer, he's really good friends with my father and he's planning to leave the country and uh, to leave to the States. And he, he wants to sell one of the apartments really badly and he wants to sell it now in a huge discount. I was like, OK, but he was like, listen, it's underground. It's on the minus one level. So uh, you might not like it. I looked at Ruba, I was like, listen, let's go and check it out. Uh, so we went and checked it out. We loved it. And we talked to the guy and we agreed with him. And it happened so fast. And Tariq became my neighbor in the same building. And we lived together there for three years. <laughs> yeah. So and it was like the f- funny story ever. And how, how it happened, man, it was crazy. Uh, for, for those that don't know, Tariq Mirza is um, he's the one-man band. And I can't pronounce the name of his band. It's... Let's... Tlipsh. Tlipsh, yes. It's T-L-E-P-S-H for those that want to check it out on, on Bandcamp or YouTube and, uh, if and the rest. If you're listening to uh, write what does it mean uh, on the chat so people will understand what it is. Yeah, uh, Tara, uh, g- give us a little uh, definition of, of what it means in uh, in the chat. But um, I was... Uh, I, I was I was actually he's one of the people that I want to have a conversation with on the podcast because I I used to give him a lot of shit for taking uh way too long to actually release music and um I'm like I was saying earlier I'm the jump out of the plane I'm the like you know just put it out into the ether put it out into the world kind of guy and uh, Tara is a very meticulous re-record and make sure it mixes right and make sure it does I have everything. a funny story about that hit <laughs> me Listen, listen, it's so funny that Tariq, as you said, he, he wanted things to be really, really, really perfect. So I got used to him like saying, listen, I have the sound that I want and it's ready. I'm going to release tomorrow. I was like, I, I used to look at him, Tariq, are you sure? And then once I challenged him, like uh, I had a bet, like, listen, you, you today you're telling me that you're releasing tomorrow. <laughs> But I'm sure that you're coming and tell me, oh, listen, I found a, a better guitar sound. I want to do it again. And actually, this, this, this is what happened. And we kept doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I always say this on the podcast. There's this amazing talk by this guy called Jack Conti, who is the CEO of, uh, of Patreon, uh, the, the website Patreon. And uh, yeah. he, has, he has this amazing uh, talk, like a TED Talk kind of thing, where he talks about art in terms of uh, publishing versus in terms of finishing. He says, uh, songs, movies, videos, uh, podcasts, whatever you're thinking of, your job isn't finishing the track. Your job is publishing. You, you Especially in yeah. this day and age, you are a, a, a music publisher. And if you don't put it out there, if you wait five years to get the right guitar tone and then wait another 10 years to get the right cymbals, you're not publishing enough for people to actually stay engaged. And... Uh, yeah. Uh, he ha- he makes this argument that even if it's not the perfect thing, the very uh, idea of uh, the emotion that you get when you finish something doesn't exist when it comes to art because art is just this like dwindling, fading out uh, vibe of of like I, this this emotion that uh, fades out eventually when your attachment to a song or to a video or to a film or something uh, happens. But um, uh, the the idea of like finishing a song like you would finish a meal like the plate is empty now doesn't exist uh and uh, he he pushes people to publish more versus finish um which which is something that i've i've taken on that's why i have 300 videos on my facebook page you know like that's why we we are on episode 67 right now and i think it's 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 such a healthy mindset to have and um yeah it's, it's one of those things frequency. that completely exactly Frequ- it's about frequency yeah. and at the end of the day if it's not uh, you learn the more you publish so if you've had you know uh 10 albums in the last 10 years uh, th- there'll be so much uh, more learning process in terms of the the output 
versus having one album in the last 10 years? I, I received uh, uh, an angry and sad emoji from one of our friends uh, because I didn't mention. So shout out to Amy, who is also our dear friend who used to also be with us at Tare and Zoya every day. <laughs> All right. Shout out to Amy. And, uh, and yeah. thank you guys for, for tuning in. Um, uh, there, like I said in the very beginning of the show, there's a, uh, we're on YouTube, we're on Twitch, and we're on Facebook right now. And uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Dubai time, uh, the audio version of this podcast will be on Spotify, Apple, uh, Google, uh, and Rami, a, b- a bunch of places. And even an RSS feed in case you want to plug it into your own uh, you know, podcast uh, app and stuff. Um, yeah. And actually, I wanted to talk about something that this is the first time I'm going to talk about it publicly. Hit it. Um, I'm, I've been, uh, it's, it's regarding my, my guitar playing. Uh, for the past, since the last time I played the show in Jordan, uh, and sorry, in Dubai, and that show for me actually was a complete disaster from my point of view, my performance point of view. Uh, uh, when I used to be a kid, I had uh, an injury f- uh, with my right hand. Um, and I didn't treat it because, you know, we were stupid kids. I just hid it from my parents and my hand was because I punched something and it was uh, a stupid thing. So, and actually I am a left-handed guy. Okay. But when I started learning the guitar, my music teacher, um, he told me, listen, learn it right-handed because it's super hard to find instruments and it will be harder for you. So, and it was a good thing, of course, from him to, to make me do that. And I learned the guitar, to play the guitar right-handed. And I've been playing all my life, you know, uh, right-handed. But then get, while get, getting older um, affected my playing and my riffing. To the point that, as I, I'm telling you, that last show, I, my performance was like a disaster and my hand, I couldn't move it freely and uh, it, was, uh, it was really uh, uh, stressing for me. Um, and then since then, I, I always try, kept trying and pushing it harder, but I kept feeling pain and all of that. And then once I was sitting with Tariq, uh, my neighbor, uh, at his uh, studio, and I was like, man, I was I used always to complain about that for him. And he was, man, please try and do this and that. Maybe it's in your head, but I keep trying. And I even went to doctors and I checked my nerves. I, I did everything. I thought that I had carpal tunnel. Um, so, and then I was sitting with, I was like, uh, you know what, man? Uh, the other day I was sitting at home and I flipped the guitar and I made it, made it uh, lefty. And I was trying to riff with my left hand and I was shocked with the things I, I was doing. I was like, what the hell? I went to Tar and was like, Tarek, look, look how, how my riffing uh, is re- it's, it's really good with my left hand. So he was like, man, why don't you switch uh, to being a left hand guitarist? guitarist? I was like, are you crazy? It took me like all my life to learn and uh, I don't have time now to spend on that. So he was like, try it. So what I did is I flipped the strings on one of my guitars uh to be able to play uh, left-handed on it but of course it's not built ergonomically to be left-handed but still I, I found a way to make it work and i started practicing to the point that i believed then i was like oh shit i have to switch to being a left-handed guitarist so i kept thinking about it and uh, how i'm going to pull it off to the point that i got then Tarek, of course he uh, uh encouraged me to do this and that's when I bought my solar left-handed guitar. So okay, I bought I bought the left-handed uh, solar guitar. Yeah, and I've been pr- and I've been practicing practicing it since then. I've been practicing left-handed guitars since uh, a year and something now. Um, not every because I still have doubts sometimes. Like every two months or three months, I go back to the, my right-handed guitars. Uh, but then I was like, no, fuck it. I have to go back to uh, the left one. So now I'm playing, I can play left and right hand guitars now. I'm still... Uh, I just uh, I just have to... that image of uh, Michelangelo uh, in uh, <laughs> in Speed Kills with the four neck guitar. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so... But wait, so, yeah, um, how, how... So the dexterity of your left picking hand, but what about your right hand on the fretboard? How does that feel? It's, it's so weird, like, of course, I still feel some pain here, but I don't feel it as much as when I am strumming. Yeah. 
So if, if I'm fretting, uh, if I'm using my right hand to fret, uh, I don't feel that li- limited movement and the pain. But weirdly, maybe I also because I'm sure that it has lots of uh, repetitive stress uh, injuries, uh, my right hand and my picking hand. So it, it's, all, uh, it's not helping at all. And that's why I'm switching. And actually, the, the song that I played, um, now, now in my right hand, I can never do tremolo uh, picking. No mm-hmm. way, no way in hell. Like uh, I'll just, um, the, the pick won't, won't, won't even get over the strings, you know. So what I had to do when I recorded that song, I recorded the whole song using my right hand, but the tremolo picking part, I recorded it using my right hand, uh, uh, my left hand picking. Um, so until our next live show, most probably I'll be playing left-handed, not right-handed. That's I find uh, that super crazy. But, but you know, the hardest thing is for me, because my right-handed guitar is like a part of me, especially uh, the mayonnaise guitar. Uh, and because it was custom made for us, it was like endorsement by Bayonis. And it's, it's, it's a really a very fine instrument and expensive instrument. Uh, and, you know, I, for me, it's, I had this emotional attachment to it. And this is like a huge part of me each two months going back to trying to play right handed. But like I learned um, there's something which is called the sunk cost fallacy. Uh, which they use a lot in business uh, and you can also apply it to your life as well which means that if you sometimes when you spend lots of time on something and if it's not working but you keep spending time on it and that's when it's a fallacy and um, and some lots of companies they do that they keep doing the same same thing while not getting good results and they don't drop it just because they spend so much time on it so uh, if you think of it this way um, Logically, it makes more sense just to, even though that I've been the, playing the guitar since I was a kid, now it made more sense for me just to drop it and switch to left-handed. So is there a, is, is there an expectation? Like you said, half of, or parts of that song that we uh, we played earlier were right-handed and then you did some of the left-hand. Is there, is the rest of the album leaning more towards the left-hand? Like this is where, yeah, where yeah. you're more comfortable now at this point? Yeah, and actually, do you remember like a while ago when I recorded, uh, I did this uh, jam with Tara when I played uh, the song by uh, At The Gates, Cold? Yeah, uh, I remember uh, JM uh, mixed one of the songs that you guys were doing, I think. Yeah, J- JM mixed the one, uh, the Megadeth one, but I did the, um, the uh, At The Gates one. Yeah. And I played it right-handed, but you can't imagine how many times I had to repeat and practice it. And it's a very simple and easy riff. But I was struggling to do it. And for me, I, I actually, I just released two the, uh, these two tracks just to make a point for myself that will it work, ever work, uh, ever work using my right hand or not? And I proved to myself that man, the amount of time I spent learning the song, uh, being able to play it with my right hand, it took so much time. While on the other hand, now with my left riffing hand, I'm able to do crazy thing, crazy mishubga riffing while like I'm not doing anything, you know, because my left hand is my dominant hand. Uh, and it was so weird, like when I when I shifted to playing left, it's as if the 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 rhythm is already built in my mind. Yeah. So I didn't face any problem, you know, doing these uh, rhythmic patterns with my left hand. But of but of course I face uh, face lots of problem with my fretting hand because uh, it takes a while until you get used to it. But uh, it, it's a fun journey. Uh, you live only once, so you have to try everything. It must have been. I can imagine it being a. Uh... Also, a scary uh, time uh, having to to think like, oh, is is the hand is a part of the way I play the instrument not not uh, feasible anymore? Because I could imagine like I've um, I've had a point in uh, in in the journey where I completely completely uh, lost my voice, completely fucked it up to a point where uh, it was it was pretty bad. Like it, you might not be able to to do those good little vocals or or scream anymore. And um, I was thinking, God damn it! Like that must have been, uh, 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 or, or that was for me uh, one of those things where it's just like, you know, did did I do something to ruin it? What am I gonna do after this? How do I? So how was that for you? Like, was it was it as scary as it was uh, oh, for man. me, or or you, did did your brain just go into that uh, drive mode and went, okay, how do I fix it? No, no, no. I, I, as I'm telling you, like uh, I was struggling with that for years. 
And actually, it was so frustrating because uh, for me, guitar is a huge part of me. And I reached the point that I didn't like to play the guitar anymore because I always felt frustrated. Like I yeah. used to spend the first two hours just to try to, you know, to warm my hand and to, to be able to make it do, to do something. And after the, and you know, when you get older and with lots of responsibilities and all that, you don't have, if, I, if, I, if I'm a kid and I don't have anything to do with just playing the instrument, maybe it will be a, an easy transition. But knowing that I won't be able to give as much time as I did when I used to be a kid. Uh, and I know that it will be like a long journey to be able to play left-handed. So uh, yeah, it was extremely scary. And um, But uh, the trigger was when I reached to a point that when I start looking at my guitar and, not, and hate picking it up and play, this for me was like, oh shit, I have to find something else to do because I really love the guitar and I want to be able to play freely again. So this is yeah. why... Uh, and with push, where uh, with the push from Tare, of course, uh, uh, I did that. And because lots of people, other friends were like, "Are you crazy? What are you doing? You're throwing all of these years in the garbage. What are you doing?" Uh, but yeah, then I did it. It uh, it feels. Uh, I, I might be doing a, a little bit of a deep dive. I might be like um, spacing out a little bit. But uh, the last couple of years with the move. Uh, with the the guitar flipping uh, to to left, uh, uh, writing the new Bilecade album, there's there's been a lot of going back to the beginning. Uh, with Toffee Melt now, you're starting from scratch. Guitar is starting from scratch. You guys are rewriting uh, 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 something that you haven't uh, released in eight years. So there's um, there's a sense of uh, of a new beginning from uh, from the conversation we're having. Yeah, uh, but. Uh, I would say it's uh, very stressful at the same time because uh, you can't handle too many things at the same time. Uh, at, at some point, you just like uh, you, you 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 have to phase out and think, uh, take everything separately. But of course, you can't because this is how life is. Uh, but you manage around it. Uh, of course, there's always stress. There, there will always be stress, but you you need to be able to work around it and find a find a way to live with that. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. If anyone in the uh, in either chat and uh, has has any questions uh, for Rami, uh, plug them in the chat right now. Uh, we'll be winding down the conversation and. Uh, Anything, anything you want to add to the conversation, do it in the chat right now, either on uh, Facebook or uh, or YouTube or Twitch. I have a million windows open, so I can make sure that I catch every single comment, guys. Um, but uh, Rami, I want to ask uh, a, a few more questions. I want to ask, uh, first of all, what do you see um, the 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 future uh, journey with with Bilocate, given the current situation of the world? Uh, you know, you guys are uh, recording the album. It's going to be um, obviously released. You uh, do you see touring? Do you see uh, future shows? Uh, how how where 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 is the hopeful uh, side when it comes to uh, to Bilocate? The way I see things now, um, it's just uh, trying to release as much as you can uh, music. As we said, the frequency thing. Still, it's I'm sure it's hard. Uh, but we're trying our best to, like, uh, you, and you know, when you have music for the, for such a long time, it, it feels it keeps getting heavier and heavier. So uh, you know, emotionally. So uh, we, we're trying our best to um, release it and uh, let it out, so we can move on and do something else. You know. Um, so, like for us now, the the the, the priority is to release uh, the songs that we have. And from then, then we'll think what, what's going to be the next step. And I'm sure it will be all digital releases, most of it, because it, this is what makes sense now. It doesn't make sense to, to do anything else than that. Yeah, uh, and, I even, and I even sometimes I was pushing, but not everyone likes this idea. Uh, you always have a pushback from uh, different members. But sometimes I used to push for even single releases. Even if you have a song, just release it. Because I believe... Now it's about frequency and people, they don't have, I don't think that people have the attention span to listen to a whole album from beginning to end in one sitting, unless you are a diehard dedicated fan for like uh, something. So I believe maybe it's it's a time to maybe to, to focus on single releases, single songs, 
uh, keep working on them. And if you, but if you have the time and the luxury of time to release a full album, then do it. But uh, if you want to stay in the market, maybe releasing singles uh, it's the best way to go uh, with the, with this with, the, with this just this change. You know, uh, the digital way of having music. 100% I completely agree and um, one of the things that uh, I did with uh, with Zvengali when it came to the album is we did release uh, an album uh, March 20th uh, like the worst timing <laughs> for for an album to drop um, uh, we, we were supposed to play a, a show with Lacuna Coil in uh, in Dubai and release the album and uh, we had plans to go to Europe and all that stuff which all came crashing down but one of the benefits that we got from pausing for a little while is uh is what you're saying we we were talking about uh, uh how to release it through uh through singles instead of just a, a chunk of an album and uh our solution to that having the fact that the album already dropped was to make a music video uh for each track and release them uh, about a month apart from each other just to kind of revive that one track and give it its own spotlight almost like a single and then, uh, you know, uh, bring it back to the album where people could check out the rest of the songs. And uh, we did that uh, on a month basis. And I think uh, it really worked out. It really worked out in our favor because there are people that uh, found the band through the one song that we released a music video for uh, and then went and checked out the rest of the album instead of, like you were yeah. saying, the diehard fan that would sit and listen to the full album and find that deep cut that uh, <laughs> that's in there uh, you know, track eight or something, and um, yeah, I think singles is uh, is going to be the way forward uh, for for a lot of different bands and musicians for sure. Tara is asking, do you think the metalheads? Uh, I'm still not sure about that issue. Well, you know, most of the times, uh, I would say like, yes, I also still sometimes listen to full album. I just play it and uh, put it. But you know, in this world. You have tons and tons of bands and music happening. So unless you're able to keep the focus and the attention of people by releasing frequently, the problem with a single release, yes, uh, this is the way I like it, of course. I would love to just release an album and just then set and promote it and talk about it. But the thing is, if you don't keep the buzz going, uh, it will die. But maybe a solution, as you said, maybe a solution to release an album and then keep giving each uh, song a spotlight and uh, maybe by doing a video clip or doing uh, something else like to give it a, a radio cut or whatever um, but yeah it, de and it depends on the band itself I believe as well uh, maybe it's hard for us to do that uh, and I understand why some of the members they uh, sometimes they don't like this idea because most of our albums they, they revolve around a concept they have a concept for this so maybe it's hard to release just singles uh, but some some and especially i say that especially for the one man band guys uh, uh, i i still push for to have single uh, releases because if you if you're if you're a single uh, man band uh, most probably you'll, you'll be doing most of the instruments and most probably uh, with the case of most of my friends most of them they will be doing the mixing and mastering so for me it doesn't make sense to wait all that time uh, to wait for a whole album. Maybe if you are a full band, yeah, that makes sense. But if you're if you're doing it by yourself, why 100%. why not keep keep releasing? And and of course, like in the case, of, I, I always say that to my friends, uh, especially Mohanad and Tare, because they work in the audio engineering. Uh, and especially like if they keep releasing, and the um, people know that uh, they do great mixes and great uh, mastering. Of course, this is also beneficial for them. Uh, people will know them from the professional side, not from this, their music uh, yeah. only, you know. So I think it's a different situation for every band and every uh, every kind of music. But yeah, you, frequency is key in this uh, day and age. Yeah, 100%, 100% agree. And uh, you mentioned uh, Mohanad as well. Uh, I'm still waiting on that second book album, bro. <laughs> I I, uh, I have that f the first one still in my car and... Um, and uh, uh, Mohanad's another person that every time I visit Jordan, I'm like, yo, man, just release, release the music, let it go. And um, I don't know, I don't know if it's a, a Jordan thing or a, or a Middle Eastern metal thing, but there's always like this, I need to make it perfect thing. Uh, because, you know, um, 
it's it's super hard to get uh, because you don't live in Europe or in the States where there's a huge scene that will recognize your music locally first, as we said in the beginning of this talk. So you want you you want to impress. This is what you want to do, you know, and you always have that feeling that I I have to make it the best way I can to to be able to impress and to stand out between all of you know all of the competition. And the other thing is, of course, that which adds to that, I'm sure most of us, uh, like, we have other things to do. And most of the time, um, sometimes I spend a month without even touching my guitar, you know. Uh, you're super busy with life. Most of people, they have kids, uh, they have things to do. So it's really hard to be, you know, 100% dedicated to making music, which, which makes it harder. And this is why I believe... If you have the situation, it's better to just release whatever you have and keep working. Because if you want to wait for a whole album, it will be years of waiting. Yeah, uh, one of my favorite people uh, that releases music, it's, uh, he, he has a lot of money, but he's not releasing a lot of money. You, um, your sound is breaking. I don't know if it's uh, from, it's clipping. Is it uh, just me or? Uh... I don't know if it's, uh, if it, nothing changed here. Uh, let me know, is it better now? No, that's uh, very crackly. Okay, uh, comments, let me know if it's, um, if it's bad or is, if it's still bad or is, if it's still bad or if it's still good. I don't know if it's still good. Uh, you just try to just do all of these things. Um, I don't know if it's because I was trying to, it's because I'm changing it, uh, I'm changing it, but I'm able to test this out and test this out. Now I think, uh, shall is I try better? and uh, look out and come back again? Is it better now? No, it's the same. Oh. Oh. Alright, um, yeah, give it a shot. Give it a shot, so we're testing things out, guys. We're testing things out. I'll get back to the call, maybe it's from my side. I'll okay, get out cool. and get in. Okay, cool. Um, the sound is super bad. Maybe the sound is just very bad for you, so uh, okay, there's a... So it's it's for everyone. It's not just for me. It's not just for me. Let's try to figure this out. Let's try to figure this out. Uh, thank you guys for uh, all the bears with this. Um, like, all this stuff happens. All this stuff happens. Um, I'm just gonna give it a shot here. Give it a shot here. So uh, so I wouldn't say that. So from your side. It's from my side, definitely. All right. So uh, uh, so hold the fort. say that the problem is yours so i'll take over the show now if you guys have any questions or uh, would like to ask something specific send it to the chat here i'll try to catch all your questions i don't know where i will be able to see them but if you have any question send this here try again yeah, yeah, it's better. All righty. Are we back? Yeah, it's We're working back. now. Yeah. Okay, sweet. Um, sorry about that, guys. Uh, if you're if you're tuning in live uh, and sat through that, um, my bad. Uh, like I said, I'm trying things out. We're trying all the things. Um, what happened was I just restarted Logic for uh, for the audio uh, nerds in the in the comments. Um, I set up this mic to go to Logic and then from Logic out into OBS. But at the same time, it's split and goes to Rami. Uh, so it's um, it's a mess. I, I try things. I, I Like I said, I jump from, <laughs> jump from the, the plane before, it, uh, before I have the parachute on. But um, yeah, we were talking about um, singles and, uh, and albums and uh, Mohanad in the comments is saying, uh, singles only devalue the music. It's for pop music. The real achievement is in the album. And he also adds, uh, the new album is almost there uh, from uh, from Buch. Mohanad always uh, has, has 
views uh, I, I would never change his opinion <laughs> so but uh, I still believe uh, it's not uh, a genre specific thing this is what I believe um, it's not like only for pop music if you want to release uh, like a single you can still do it with metal and there's lots of examples and lots of bands that they did that and they did it in a very successful way and in a very nice way so yeah i don't think that this style is like uh, you know just for one style sorry mohanad i disagree with you <laughs> yeah shout out uh, shout out to mohanad and i'm i'm excited to to listen to the album but i also um, i also disagree i think i think there's a there's a cool balance between uh, the the singles uh, and the album, but I don't think the singles is a specific uh, genre, um, a, a genre specific thing is, is what I want to say. Um, a safe is in the house. He says it happens in audio, a hundred percent, man. I don't know, uh, I don't know if it's audio or, or if it's just logic or uh, or my setup, but uh, you know, it, it always uh, it always goes a little bad. Um, Ahmed saying a quick question. Uh, do you think that metal might be more known if it was more introduced into mashups? Um, I can take yeah. a little uh, lead on that. Uh, I think metal uh, would would be um, a, a bigger genre, especially uh, if it was accepted more into pop culture uh, and, and not necessarily mashups. But like I remember in the 90s and early 2000s when it was cool to have a metal band uh, be the soundtrack to a movie, for example, where like, you know, Disturbed yeah. or um, Drowning Pool and that whole metalcore wave was happening. Uh, they were the Even soundtrack. Cannibal Corpse and uh, Ace Ventura. Cannibal Corpse and Ace Ventura, the soundtrack to those movies. Yeah. Uh, the the I remember um, Triple X with Vin Diesel. Uh, it was it was basically a metal album. It wasn't a, a soundtrack. Um, that that would be very beneficial for for metal in general. If you have an indie movie coming out, instead of just going to your uh, radio playlist, instead of uh, going going to the hits, uh, you know, get get a metal band to write something for it. Get um, you know an, an indie independent metal band, even a huge metal band. You know, Hatebreed uh, was a was a the soundtrack to a lot of these uh, uh, movies in the in the early two thousands, which I think is. Uh, Put, put a lot of bands on the map and then it stopped all of a sudden like no one wanted yeah. <laughs> metal in their in their movies and stuff anymore because um, it wasn't it stopped being cool anymore so yeah 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 but um but that was the uh that was the gist of it and uh i don't know what do you think rami uh well you know listen i would love metal to be uh, like more accepted by more people uh, because it will give chance to, because I love metal, you know, and uh, it's the yeah, it's one of the genres that I always listen to, um, and and I believe that if if they had more chance, uh, and if, if you get, if you tell people what it really represents and uh, why we like it, uh, maybe they will accept it more. But the, the thing is, it's a matter of taste at the end. Um, I, I don't like. A specific kind of music because it's popular or if it's uh, if it's underground. This is not why I like metal. Uh, I just like it because for what it is, you know. And uh, even if it stays underground, if it stays uh, not really popular, I don't care about that. Uh, what I care about is to have good music and um, keep uh, and, and band there keep they're going, you know. They're, they're not stopping, which is really cool. Uh, and uh, and of course, giving the modern technology and how e easy it is now to record an album and to release an album, it made it even. You have uh, literally, you know, when I go to band camp and when I see the suggested bands, I get lost, man. You know, it's it's like as if you're going into a Wikipedia page and keep click, clicking on these small links yeah. and you end up uh, in a rabbit hole. It's yeah, the exact yeah. th same thing uh, on band camp. So, which is cool. Uh, and as long as it, it's, it's happening this way, it's nice. But the problem with that is most of the time musicians, they don't make money out of it, which is a sad thing, of course. Uh, and for me, I see uh, stupid music. I, I, sometimes, I will call it stupid because for me, it's stupid. Uh, make, if, uh, some people, they're making millions out of it. I understand that this is the pop culture and this is like the general mass, what they like. But still, uh, it feels sad that uh, these kind of people, they, they are able to make uh, money with that kind of music, and but metalheads, they can't. Uh, but it's a fact that I, I don't think that it will be changing anytime soon. Unless See, we I... turn into... 
a cyberpunk a cyberpunk uh, <laughs> time where people will love just metal and put metal everywhere but, uh, this is not happening anytime yeah cool. see i uh, i come from a different background i come from the the idea that i don't have a lot of attachment to the um elitism or in metal like i don't care uh, about like oh um, if you're a metalhead you have to sound this way or if you're a metalhead you have to look this way or uh, you you can't say you're a metalhead if you don't like Slayer for you know what I mean all these little things oh, yeah yeah of course I agree um, that that I think a lot of a lot of people uh, in the metal community spe- specifically in the Middle East have a lot of that um, very specific ideology of what a metal head and a metal band and a metal anything should look like which I believe. Uh, is the exact opposite of the entire ideology of metal. It's rebelling and it's not conforming and it's 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 a, it has a very um, anti-authoritarian attitude. And I love the elitists because they're like, we're so anti-authoritarian, but you have to listen to this and you have to wear black and you have to be this guy. And uh, I, I think it's it's just hilarious when it when it comes to uh, metal bands in the Middle East that. Um, that disagree that you can break out of the uh, quarter box of metal. But you know, I, I would disagree on something that this is not only in the Middle East. You can see this everywhere. Yeah, 100%. Uh, and, and, and it makes sense because we humans, we are built in a way that we like to, to relate to a group. Uh, this is like uh, by evolution and this is how we evolved to, uh, to be who we are now. Uh, we evolved around our being in, in small groups, and the smaller the group is, and the, small, the, the, the more niche it is, the more the connections you have. And this is why you see things like this. Uh, and actually, I've been really interested in these kind of topics, and I've been listening to lots of podcasts about uh, social uh, sciences and all of these things. So when you when you hear these topics from a scientific way, you understand why things they are the way it is. Um, uh, and now we, I, I see it. I see like. Uh, I know how, why people like to wear black when you're metal and because you want to relate to that group, even though that maybe it doesn't mean something, you know, there's no hidden meaning behind it. But still, be, being that metalhead and being having that look, it will make you more closer to the group that you belong to, you feel that you belong to, which is at the end, it's, it's cool. Like This is cool about metal. And, and of course, whoever went to a metal festival, uh, you feel this feeling, you know, when you go to Vakin, when you went to 2015, um, it was one of my best experiences ever. It, it has 120,000 people and you, you don't know anyone, but you, you still feel that connection yeah. because there is one, one, one thing that binds all of us. Even that met- festival, sometimes you see music that you will never listen to in your whole life, you know, but still it's all under the metal umbrella and you feel that connection with that people, w- which makes these kind of things cool either it's metal or it's uh, hip hop or it's whatever it is you know it's, it's a group that you belong to and if you belong to that group and if you blend to that group you feel good about it and this is what's cool about these kind of things uh, i remember there was a, a documentary way back in the day um by a guy called sam dunn from canada um he uh yeah, he the, um, headbangers journey and uh and um um a global metal, I think it was called, and but the first one, had Banger's yeah. Journey. Uh, he he looked at um, metal from an anthropological uh, anthropology point of view uh, as a tribe, which I thought was uh, was yeah. very cool. But um, what I was talking about that 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 uh, in itself, I'm 100 percent for, 100 percent agree with. I think the the stuff I'm talking about is the hierarchy of uh, metal within that community itself. Uh, which is uh, which is something that I, I've never understood. Even when I was a kid, even when I was the guy that thought, you know, to be a metalhead, you have to do certain things or you have to listen to certain bands and stuff. Or, uh, you know, clean vocals is not metal. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but now I'm just like, I don't, it, it doesn't make any sense to me because the whole, the whole like I said, the, uh, you know, the ethos of, of metal and hardcore and punk is, anti-authoritarian and stuff and then we go and put rules on our own little subculture it's it's such a strange uh, dichotomy that happens oh yeah yeah of course uh, and uh, you know as i told you before like um, you always have people that re- misrepresent something and uh, you find this everywhere um and that's why um General people, uh, literally like here and Amsterdam, sometimes like I'm walking, you can never tell if I didn't have the beard, you would never even tell that I, I listen to metal music, you know, uh, uh, and uh, I don't care about that. Yeah, For me, listening and doing something that I like, it's just about me. 
uh, enjoying it, uh, whatever it is, even if I wear black or, or I wear green or whatever. So um, at the end, you enjoy uh, the, what you do. And when you listen to music, you listen to it by yourself, unless you are at a festival nowadays. So nobody cares, you know? Yeah, 100%. Um, shout out to uh, Mike Angelo in the comments over on Facebook. He says, um, he says, shout out to Canada, first of all. Thank you for tuning in from Canada. And yes, Sam Dunn was, uh, was a Canadian filmmaker and uh, was, is, he still is, by the way. He, he didn't, didn't go anywhere. Uh, he, Mike Angelo also says, Jim Carrey loves death metal. And yeah, uh, yeah I've, I've heard that too. I, I saw this weird interview uh, on one of the talk shows, like way back in the day where he, um, he talks about Napalm Death. And he does this really cool skit where he's like, imagine uh, the vocalist from Napalm Death, you know, calms down and uh, and wants to do a duet with with a, with a female vocalist somewhere down the line. And he does this really amazing skit of like this uh, orchestral duet, uh, but with death metal vocals. It was really funny. Yeah. Uh, if you're listening to this, Shout you should... Uh, Mike, thank you for uh, being with us here. Shout out to Mike Angelo. Um, Let's, uh, there's a bunch of comments uh, in uh, over on YouTube. Maad is saying, um, regarding the music influences of the new album, will it be a death slash doom like sudden death syndrome or more proggy slash melodic death uh, like summoning the bygones? Uh, it will be more... Uh, actually, it's, uh, it's funny, but it's a fusion between both. So we, uh, it has uh, lots of heavy orchestration. Uh, and lots of uh, nice uh, keyboard uh, done by Wasim, um, and but while also keeping that uh, fast uh, uh, riffing and heavy riffing from uh, summoning the bygones. Uh, but we also like we, we try our best to incorporate these slow, you know, uh, shipped parts. I don't know if they uh, they call uh, if you can call that a breakdown. Uh, I can. Uh, I, I don't like to call it a breakdown. It's, it's a, 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 a breakdown. Of, uh, a, a breakdown in my version of of metal is uh, is what happens when the mosh pit opens up. But that's not what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, the change of parts. Uh, yeah, we still have these, uh, you know, uh, changing from fast to aggressive to clean parts to uh, bass uh, solos with just keys. So we, yeah, we're, we're trying to explore all of these aspects of our music. Yeah, very cool. I think I think the maturity of a band always ha that always kind of uh, develops. I I feel like uh, the the last album you do is a combination of all the stuff that you've released before instead of a copy of the the last one. Um, it, it always yeah. it always grows, especially when you take your time. Like you guys took eight years. I'm sure there's a bunch of stuff that you pulled uh, from before and added a bunch of new recipes to the mix. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, we're very excited about it. So. Hopefully we'll be able to release it uh, very soon. Uh, Tara in the comments is saying, did you feel uh, your playing genre-wise changed while switching from your left hand to your right hand? That's a good question. Uh, actually, it's, it's funny uh, because I was always a fan of, uh, you know, uh, black metal style riffing and uh, tremolo picking, but I was never able, even when I was like in my best playing times, my hand was even by then it was giving me lots of limitations so then i, I found myself playing lots of songs uh, black metal songs and doing the riffs that i always in my mind i was playing but i couldn't do with my right hand uh and also uh, now I'm, I'm doubling down more on the uh, rhythmic uh, style of um, picking like lots of uh, iced earth and th this kind of you know uh, very uh, rhythmic uh, play a style of playing um for so yeah i i see a change i played i play different songs but i i keep also this is also i keep this consciously in my mind which is something i already thought about uh should i um shift my playing style to something else now since that i have the ability to play differently or shall i keep true to my original way of playing and uh, the style i used to play uh, but then I realized that uh, it's not a choice that I have to make. It's not, uh, you know, white or black. Um, I can do both and uh, I can enjoy, you know, playing the same thing that I used to play while having also now the ability to play uh, something different. Yeah, I think that's that's really crazy when you put it that way, because then you look back and you're like, have I been boxed in? Is is uh, is it is it something that I was limited to or is this a choice? 
that I made to make that kind yeah. of, uh, you know, use these yeah, exactly. specific techniques or not. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and now, because I'm just learning and I don't have time to relearn everything, I, I, I find myself, you know, uh, not doing the things that I, I'm supposed to do, like playing all of these kind of uh, chord shifting songs that you used to uh, when you start playing, when you do lots of these crazy chords and all of that. I find myself not doing it a lot, which is, of course, bad. You have to uh, practice doing that. But um, now I play what I, I have been wanting to play for so long. So I'm enjoying it, you know, uh, playing everything that I couldn't do with my right hand. Uh, but I'm sure at some point uh, I'll, I'll jump back to the things that I used to play and practice on them. Because, of course, uh, the instrument, you need to know it, to know everything. And to be able to play professionally, you have to do everything that you used to do. Yeah, I, I do believe that uh, playing it completely the opposite way is is one of those things where you could say, you know what, I'm a guitarist. I play on both sides of <laughs> both sides of the thing. And but it's uh, so crazy when I started doing that uh, because you know when you play on the guitar like you're holding like this, you know when you go up the pitch, you you, you move from my side from left to right. So when I switched the guitar, I kept going the same way but the wrong way. But in my mind. <laughs> Like if I wanted that to, way is the higher note. Exactly. So I, I struggled when I started uh, start doing that. Uh, I kept going the other opposite way until I trained my brain that no, I have to go that way. Um, and the, what the funny thing is, uh, when I used to think about playing guitar, even when I started practicing lefty, uh, when I imagined myself playing, I kept imagining myself playing still right-handed. Mm -hmm. But just recently, two months ago, I think, when I start imagining myself, I caught myself imagining playing it lefty. Mm -hmm. So I think now I, my brain did that. It uh, accepted it, it finally. It, it accepted it, yeah. And uh, now when I imagine myself playing, I imagine it playing left-handed. Uh, uh, it's funny how the brain works. Uh, Tara in the comments is making a joke about uh, now you're on the left-handed path and you're playing more death metal. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> which is which is I'll a go to hell faster now because it's, it's, I play the guitar lifting. It's the the most dad joke we've had all uh, all podcast. Thanks for that. Uh, thought it for thank you, thought it for the dad jokes. <laughs> uh, safe in the comments saying super true on uh, metal elitism, Adnan. Uh, thank you, man. Um, safe is uh, for those that don't know. He's uh, he's in a metal band here called Metal Rust, and I'm uh, super stoked to hear. Uh, what you guys have been recording, man, and um, very excited to have you on the show very soon. Um, yeah, metal elitism is is one of those things that I love to talk about just because it it bothers the people that I talk about. <laughs> it's uh, it's I like I like to uh, to annoy the people that uh, that take it very seriously. Um, Ahmed saying, I remember when oh I can't say that word Ahmed on the uh, on the stream, but I remember when a certain group uh, of uh, I can't say any of the words. <laughs> Drop that, Ahmed. Uh, don't talk about these topics, please. Yeah. I'm sorry, Next. Ahmed. I can't. I can't read. Uh, I can't read that comment. But um, uh, Mohad is saying you should all check Sam Dunn's channel. I guess it's called Banger TV. Yes, absolutely. I completely agree. Um, I'm also a patron on uh, on Banger TV. I uh, I try to support the the channel because they're they're doing it all independent and it's a great uh, channel for for metal in general. Um, yeah, uh, so I have one last question for you, Rami, before, before I let you go. And uh, thank you so much for uh, for the time. I know it's uh, w we've been at it for two hours and a half, bro. It's okay, man. Uh, I enjoyed every uh, minute of it. So it's, it's, it's been okay. it's been absolute an absolute pleasure to uh, to dig deeper with you. But um, I have I have one last question. I I love to end uh, each episode with this question, and um, a lot of people take it uh, a lot of different directions, but if you had a time machine and um, mm. you were to go back to, to young Rami Haikal just before, uh, you know, Bilocate kicked off, just before uh, uh, Toffee Melt was was a thing, before you moved to the Netherlands, um, before you experienced everything you experienced and you were to go back in time and give young Rami uh, one piece of advice, uh, what would that piece of advice be? Hmm, tricky question. So that advice would be uh, to, you know, I, I learned the hard way that um, 
in order to achieve something uh, and I'm still learning of course uh, that you you make your own luck uh, by by being there by doing things by meeting people by uh, you know doing crazy things um, so I would go back to myself and say that uh, to, to, to teach myself that on an early age because it really makes a huge difference um, like I started doing that uh, not very like not very long time ago when I understood that concept and in order to get the things you want you have to make yourself available so I would go back to myself and say yes if you want something you have to make yourself available for it um, it's I, I don't believe in luck and luck in the word luck I'm a very like logical guy and I don't believe I just believe in numbers and logic so uh, and I, I know that uh, the more you make yourself available it's, it will make your the higher the probabilities and chances will be for you to uh, uh, to get the things you want let's say so yeah I would go back and tell myself this to do to, to, to do that on an early age <laughs> Ma- an make, early make age. yourself more available for for the opportunities to actually be able to, to come your way yeah, exactly, exactly. Because, uh, you know, sometimes we think that if you want something, then you keep dreaming about it and you just say, yeah, you, you do something small. And so, yeah, it will happen, it will happen. But unless you really make yourself, uh, put yourself there uh, in front of the people that you want them to uh, even recognize your work, or if, even if it's work, personal life, uh, band, whatever it is, uh, unless you make yourself there in front of people, no one will know about you. So, and and this is how, this is why, this is luck for me. Luck is just being yourself available for people. And with those words, ladies and gentlemen, we end uh, episode sixty-seven. Rami, man, thank you so much for uh, for your time. Thank you, Adnan, and thank you for everyone uh, who tuned in for this uh, amazing talk show. And I wish you success. Uh, and thank you everyone thank you my dude thank you to everyone that tuned in live and uh, if you didn't tune in live if you're re-watching this either on YouTube Twitch or Facebook or listening to the audio over on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or any of that stuff um, uh, know that uh, that I appreciate you and um, just send us, a, send us a little message. If you've made it this far into the podcast, send us a little message on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, let us know what you think of the show. And um, yeah, make sure you follow the pages. Uh, there's an Instagram page and all that stuff uh, that keeps you up to date on the guests coming up. It's this- oh, this is the first time that we don't hit the outro right as you said hit the outro. <laughs> because I, I was talking uh, while you were still talking, so we have to give it uh, a proper G- give it Give uh, it a proper farewell. Let's do it. Hit the outro, Adnan. <laughs>